because I never had sex with him. You sucked his dick. Hey, Kaiser here. So you might have noticed that this week we posted a video called Demon Slayer in Six Minutes. It was a hell of a lot of fun to make and definitely required a lot of visual edits. And a lot of people have been asking me, hey Scott, how do you do what you do? Unfortunately, I'm kind of a terrible teacher, but I can point you in the right direction with Skillshare. Skillshare is a wonderful community full of creative people who want to teach you a new hobby or how to turn that hobby you've got into a career. They've got classes on illustration, graphics design, marketing, web development, film and video, animation, it runs the gamut. And the first thousand people to click the link in the description will get their first two months of premium membership absolutely free. So yeah, Skillshare, give it a try. And uh, maybe you can give me a run for my money. It is not that hard. I literally just learned how to use the puppet tool. Skillshare! Hello and welcome to the TotCast Pod Show, the number one show on the internet and the new breed of airbender. I'm Lanny and I'm joined this week by your favorite mover star, Kaiser Neko. I would have gone, gone with Kaiser? I would I would have gone with footage bender, but I'll go with mover star. Well, if they may, you know what? When we come back for the live action Avatar adaptation <laughs> of Netflix, I'll I'll keep that one in mind. Oh boy! Oh boy! So, Legend of Korra dropped. Uh, currently sitting, I think, at like number six on their trending list. Uh, it, it dipped a lot quicker than the last Airbender, but oh there's, there's, no, there's, you there's, don't there's, say. There's there's reasons for that. I'm surprised that putting Korra on there didn't bump Last Airbender back up onto the list. Honestly. You know what? Uh, it, hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. I can see a lot of people being like, oh, Korra's up. Now I'm going to watch them both. I mean, maybe like that show. did happen, but. Yeah, it, it. I mean, it probably did. There are probably people that went back and watched through Avatar of like, you know, just, oh, there's two of these shows? Like, maybe they didn't get it the first time. It's like, oh, okay, hold on. Maybe, maybe I should watch through these. So it, it probably got a bump. Kind of like uh, anybody who's familiar with YouTube, whenever you upload something that's like part of a similar series, everything before it gets a bump. So I'm sure that, you know, while it might yeah. not have been as big, it was there. Uh, but this is easily one of the more uh, controversial shows that Nickelodeon has put out. Uh, oh, in terms far. of how, how it divided the fan base, a lot of people look at it like, this ruined Avatar, uh, I, I hate what they did to all the characters, I would have rather just watched Adventures of Grown Up Aang and Sokka and all them. Uh, I mean, uh, let me put it out there, uh, I did not want Adventures of Grown Up Aang and all them. I mean, if, if we'd gotten like maybe an episode or some stuff on that, that would have been neat, but I definitely... kind of did. Yeah, well, we we kind of did. We we got a little bit of the whole Yakon stuff, which we'll get into. But like, honestly, I did not need a an entire series about grown up Aang and friends. We had their stories, and they were great, and I'm glad. But yeah, no, no and, thanks. Which is uh, part of kind of the magic of like this universe that they created with Avatar. They have this cycle where, okay, every generation, there's a new one. So you get to have this like awesome passage of time. You get introduced to a whole bunch of new characters and they have their own little journeys that they have to deal with. I, th I think it is a brilliant concept for a an amazing universe that like is full, like jam packed with possibilities that I, I don't think Nickelodeon even wanted to come close to trying to, you know, tap into the potential of that. Like they literally could have had like a Harry Potter or a Star Wars on their hands with this. Yeah, that's sort of an interesting point. Uh, and I think that's really, I think that is uh, encapsulated by the fact that when Korra came back, they were like, no, we just want the one season. And then Bright was like, okay, one season. And then, oh, uh, and then, oh, and then. Yeah. Yeah, by the way, for anybody, for anybody who doesn't know, um, which if you're a fan of Korra, but aren't familiar with its background, Korra was only going to be one season originally. Um, it was and it kinda, just... And it kind of shows. It kind of shows. Oh, it very much shows. Uh, but with the ending of season one not sen setting up anything for, this, uh, for its se the seasons after, you can really tell that, no, 
this was supposed to just be a mini series. And then Nickelodeon was like, no, we want three more seasons. And then, and then they said, oh, and by the way, not only do we want three more seasons, but they're all going to be the same length as the first one. And you can't have a continuous story between them. They all have to be their own isolated seasons telling yeah, one see, overarching that, that, story. That, that was the that was the question I was going to have there, because uh, unlike The Last Airbender, which had one drawn out continuous plot that it followed every single season, like it felt like Nickelodeon was renewing as they went along because mm -hmm. and, and, that, and that's part of the. Uh, on one hand, problem of Korra, but there's also, like, uh, I guess a little bit of silver lining to that in that, you know what, if, if you do just want to stop somewhere, you just can. Yeah, uh, at the end unfortunately, of... Unless, uh, unfortunately, well, except for, you don't well, want to stop on. at the what, end of what season I, three. Yeah, what I was about to say is, unfortunately, season two is kind of in the middle of that, so <laughs> nobody blames you if you want to stop there, but the... Okay, how would you rank the seasons of Korra? Because I because I know how like my tier list of the Korra seasons. Oh, Obviously, uh, like put it put it out of the way. Season two is at the bottom. I'm going to assume. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. But like, how how would you rank them? For me personally, it's uh, let's see, three, one, four, two. I agree. Three and one are kind of like toss upable in my mind, but yeah. three is. Three has one of the most compelling villains and easily some of the best fight choreography. Yeah, because it's it's tough because I'll say that one has a better overall story than three does, partially yes. because I just it, I feel like it's a cohesive whole and there aren't it a was bunch more of... it was more coherent and they were able to plan it out. <laughs> yeah, um, but three has these amazing like dramatic moments such uh, some I'm sorry the stuff with the Beifong family is actually really mm. good. Uh, and the action scenes are the best that the show has ever had. Season three has the best action scenes in all of Avatar or Korra, and it's amazing. Um, but you're not wrong in that. I could, it, on, on on a different day, it could have been one, three, four, two. Yeah, I, I, I put a caveat on the best fights because there is one fight that really sticks out to me. And by the way, spoilers for Korra. Just oh yeah, yeah. Straight, super straight spoilers. up spoilers. Yeah. Uh, this this show's been out for what, like five, six years, seven years now, something like that. Uh, it's been out on Netflix for a couple of weeks now. If you haven't seen it yet, please, like you know, by all means, treat yourself. Uh, it's not as good as the last Airbender overall. I do think it has some pretty high peaks, but its valleys lie way lower. Yes. Uh, and, and, and that's, I, I was thinking the other day, I was like, wow, this is a lot like Dragon Ball Super, where its peaks yeah, are incredibly high, and it's it can be incredibly well animated, but then it does things that just kind of really make me not like the show. It's it's not like they introduced anything like Metachlorians, uh, well, I mean, I guess they uh, kind I of, actually, they I kind actually of did. disagree. Oh, okay, let, okay, let's we'll, go. We'll, we'll get, we'll get to that. Yeah. I, I, I did want to point out my one caveat. I think... One of the best fight sequences, like, animated out in the show is Korra versus Kuvira, their first duel. Oh, that fight is, that fight is brutal, too. Yeah, it, like, it just really shows that they put a lot of effort into, okay, what does, like, earthbending in combat look like? Because she's doing these low leg sweeps and, like, the ground's moving towards her. And then when Korra, like, jumps over that, she does, like, a swift roundhouse kick. And you can see her pick up a rock from the dirt with her foot as she's doing it. And it goes flying. It's it's so cool. Like, just the little details in a lot of this choreography, it's, it's no wonder that this show was nominated for so many daytime Emmys for its animation. Yeah. Uh, anything I uh, I'm going to be mean to this show during this by the way I want y'all to know I'm gonna be as fair as I possibly can I'm not gonna be a, a screamy whiny bitch but man I have some problems with the show and I'm not going to treat it nicely I'm probably not going to disagree with a lot of the things you disliked about it but overall I think I'm more positive on Korra well I, I was also I really going to say, like yeah I was also gonna say I'm never gonna get down on its art and animation though and it's fights, and it's music. Like, in terms of visuals and audio, this show, I've got almost zero complaints. I think there were some parts where the music could have been better, and obviously season two splits between uh, Studio Pierrot and Studio Mir, but otherwise, 
this is a beautiful show made by people who are va very passionate about it. And I don't want to dis disqualify all that passion that went into the show. Cause you can tell how much actually went into making Korra happen. There are some points where they're trying to blend the CGI with the hand animation though, where it starts to look just a little Berserk 2016. <laughs> Like, just just a bit. Like, when there are a lot of people in the background and they don't want to hand animate all the people doing stuff, it, it it gets a little clunky. But you know what? When when the animation is actually, like, on point and it's, like, you know, the focal point of what's happening, yeah, it is mwah, beautiful. Uh, but, you know, let's, let's start at the uh, beginning, beginning. What were your thoughts when you first heard that Avatar was getting another series? Actually, I remember being really excited about this because when they were talking about like, oh yeah, it's going to be a series all about a female Avatar. Uh, and I, I hated the name at first though. I was like, Korra? Sounds like Coral. This is dumb. <laughs> of course, I got over that. Uh, but yeah, the moment I saw the first promotional art... And and it it was it was Cora standing next to um, oh gosh I forget the name of the dog the polar bear dog Naga Naga standing next to Naga looking out of Re Republic City and I remember like I was like that's a is that a is that a woman because you know Cora cuts a very masculine frame from the back um, yes uh, immediately apparent is the fact that this isn't a story about you know like the the same sort of coming of age tale that Ang had from boyhood to slightly older boyhood this is uh, <laughs> yeah. this is somebody who is already you know in their kind later of in teens. their young yeah in in their young adulthood already yeah and which it, it was actually really interesting to me and they also said like this is going to be a darker more mature story so i was already incredibly excited and then we got you know the first scene that they showed online was the uh, chase between her and the metal bending police officers and i mm -hmm. was instantly about it i i couldn't believe how good the show looked sounded felt the fact that they were going for this 1920s uh you know like chinatown feel i i was all i, I wanted this show more than anything in the world when they showed that <laughs> I loved, uh, yeah, like, like you, like, when, as soon as I saw that scene, I'm like, hell yeah. In fact, I think you were the one that linked it to me, uh, just, like, to kind of show me it. Yeah, uh, that sounds right. And, and at, at that time, I hadn't seen all of The Last Airbender. I, I knew it from, like, beginning to end, but I hadn't been able, like, you know, the trappings of network television, I hadn't been able to catch every single episode by that point. But uh, I instantly fell in love with the fact that they went from this old sort of like semi feudalistic era to the roaring 20s within a generation which kind of makes sense with how they were showing like the progression of technology moving along yeah they were uh, pretty they already had fucking steam jet skis mm -hmm. which i got yeah, like they, they, they were they were primed and ready for like that jump into the industrial revolution yeah uh and th then they left past that within La ang's lifetime i guess <laughs> and so you have this like beautiful little roaring twenties setting, lots of like hot jazz stings in the musical chords, like, uh, but it's still mixed in with that old sort of, um, I, I don't know what you'd call it other than uh, sort of Eastern of, like yeah. in like mus musical cuts. Yeah, uh, they they still used a lot of what they did was they used a lot of Eastern instruments to yeah. also uh, supplement the jazz stylings that they were going for, which was really cool. That was a really interesting idea. Mm -hmm. The mixture works. I, I, I will actually say this. With the exception of a couple of tracks from Avatar, generally the music in Korra is better. Like, I, I fully believe the music from Korra is better than most of the music from Avatar The Last Airbender. Not all, I but definitely most. I don't disagree that it's definitely something that I could, like, s drive around in my car listening to, whereas uh, almost all the music from Avatar The Last Airbender is something that I could maybe sit around and meditate to, which which speaks more to the tones that the shows kind of give off, yeah. I think, and, like, the, the like what they're going for. But I, I was instantly drawn into the world uh, as soon as, like, the episodes started coming out. Uh, I, I really liked it. Like, I, I love the... 
the world of season one, like the the city of Republic City, the fact that uh, Toph literally invented the police force and taught them all how to metal bend, just being like, hey, assholes, you're going to do this now. This is how you apprehend people. They can't fight it. They'll deal. I won't lie. Um, so the first season introduces a lot of yes. things that are very... That, that really kind of upset the status quo of Avatar The Last Airbender, um, including, hey, uh, so lightning benders, they're actually way more common nowadays, which some people were actually really frustrated with, but I actually was on board with that because of the idea of um, back when the Fire Nation was ruling everything, uh, much like a fascist dictatorship does, it actually suppressed the skills uh, of, of the, the lower class. Of the lower class. You don't want people being strong enough to overthrow their own government, so you keep them weak, you keep them uneducated, you keep them in line. Um, and so that was really interesting, where, oh yeah, no, they're gone, and now this information is open to everybody. So yeah, I'm not, I wasn't surprised that there's a bunch of lightning benders nowadays. That's fine. It, it also, it also makes sense from the perspective of, um, like, how education seems to grow throughout, because you knew more from grit, like, uh, I mean, you know, on a basic level, maybe not on a life skill level, but you knew more on a scientific level graduating from high school or, you know, middle school than your great grandparents would have learned by, you know, going through all of the years of schooling that they possibly could have. Yep. It, it's just, it's just how the generations go and how we uh, kind of hold on to intelligence and decide what we are going to teach the next generation. If lightning bending turns out to be a very useful skill for the economy, guess what's going to be taught a lot more to firebenders? Yep, and that's... See, this is where, like, there's a lot of really fascinating things going on just through... Without saying a damn thing in the actual story itself. Just visual storytelling, envir the environment, world building. And it's so interesting because... With some of the things it doesn't say, there are a lot of things that it says and doesn't represent, which I think, you know, we'll get into that with Amon. I also want to say, yeah. I also want to say the one thing about the season that I, that going back and rewatching the show, I still didn't like, which was the fucking pro bending. I'm sorry, I did not like the pro bending stuff. It actively just kind of made me tune out. You can tell that a lot of people didn't because they dropped it in season two almost instantly. Yeah. Uh, I personally kind of liked it. I, I like it when you give me a little fictional sport that's kind of cool. It's like it, it had a neat concept and it was very easy to learn the rules. Like by the time you finish watching the second or third match of it, you kind of get the point of it. And yeah, I it, think it, like I, I, I thought it was ultimately kind of harmless and it made sense for the world to have something like that. And in. The major thing is that it does ultimately play into the story in an interesting mm -hmm. way. And that was the thing. That was the only reason I valued it was when Tano shows up. When Tano shows up and he's cheating and getting away with it, very obviously it helps to make a point, which I appreciated that. But you have all these episodes that first are a fictitious sport. And I'm sorry, fictitious sports are not that interesting to watch for someone like me because all I can think is like, well, I mean scripted stuff already like for, for stuff like this is always kind of up in the air but also it took bending and really broke it down to kickboxing with ben with bending and i was like ooh, okay one of the cool parts about bending is how it uses different types of martial arts um and implements that in the choreography and here it's like no just you know bob and weave and and punch and then you you do it better and it's like okay i guess I, I don't know. I, I was not about the pro bending myself, uh, but luckily it does tie into the story. So at least it serves a narrative purpose that I appreciated. It's Yeah, the, the thing you're going into there, the fact that like everybody had the same form and function. It makes sense that they have that, though, because uh, if you look at it from the perspective of like a professional sport, like um, uh, let, let's say, let's say MMA. Which honestly, pro bending MMA, we which we actually get kind of a actually uh, that was a little the original bit of a taste idea. of that was the original yeah, like, idea with pro bending, by the way, before they made yeah, it with the whole point bending system. cage fighting. Yeah, but the point is, uh, as if you want to do something effectively, in this case, it's you know hit your opponents and knock them off the edge from a distance. You're going to develop a particular type of form and function that is going to be able to combat all of the other forms 
and, you know, allow you to use your movement to kind of like, you know, faint, juke, and move. And boxing is a very good example of uh, how that would exist in a proper format. So to me, when they're all using kind of the same stance and doing the same moves, which, which they aren't really. Like the Earthbender, like the Earthbender does have different like attack patterns from the Waterbender, which has a different one from the Firebender. Yeah. If you look at it closely. I mean, no, uh, they're, it, they're not all the same. It just, it, yeah. yeah, go ahead. But it makes sense that they would all kind of have like adopted the same style in that because it's, it turns out that that's what's most effective. Like modern MMA these days, it's all kind of the same blended martial art. Whereas uh, UFC and shows like it started off with people having studied very different martial arts and going against each other, which which was the idea of that. Like, you know, let's see which martial art is better. It all sort of coalesced into what is commonly known as MMA now. So the form just kind of changes as time goes on with that type of sport. Mm -hmm. We have spent significantly longer talking about pro bending than I expected. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, okay, I want to talk about... Actually, uh, you know what? I'm going to do something that's going to be completely opposite of the last two shows we talked about. One being Avatar and the other one Harley. I want to talk about Korra as a character in the first season. Because this is... this Like, we can talk about Amon all fucking day. But I think Korra is a character that I actually really wanted to love when the show started. And I the show... You used the word, I, I noticed you used the word wanted. Because the show makes it really hard. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it does. Yeah. No, I... So, in the first couple of episodes, it's... it. She kind of goes back and forth between between being this girl um, who knows what her purpose is and wants to fulfill that purpose, but because of her limited exposure to the world, does not understand how everything works, much less her actual self. Like, she has an idea of who she is supposed to be in that first season, but she doesn't actually know. This is the first time she's been out on her own after she's been locked away for so long. And unfortunately, because of the way the writers decided to portray her in that first season, she doesn't come off as this likable but flawed person. She just comes off as a brat, as a, as a, as a very, not selfish, but like pushy, ignorant brat which i i didn't want to be the case like i still loved certain scenes with her she's she's this amazingly designed character it's just the writing mm -hmm. fails her and oh my god the stuff with mako is awful oh my god oh, oh, I, I okay just wanna... yeah Ma Ma mako is honestly one of my least favorite parts of the series but uh I actually disagree with you, like not in terms of like how she is portrayed, because, yeah, she she does come across as a little bit bratty, a little bit pushy and a little bit assertive. Uh, but when you're introduced to her, even as a baby, like, you know, as a toddler walking in, I'm the avatar. You got to deal with it. It already sets up that she's, you know, hot headed. She's 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 kind of like in your face about this. And the fact that they had her locked away until she's I don't know how old she's supposed to be 16. when this starts. I'm yeah, 16. Yeah. Uh, the fact that they had her locked away in this uh, White Lotus facility, just teaching her avatar stuff, teaching her bending. Uh, obviously, nobody touching on the spiritual side that often, except for Tenzin, who could like maybe stop in every once in a while when he's not trying to repopulate the airbending nation. And his... doing a great job of it. Good Lord, man. Yeah, dear God, that that poor woman. <laughs> <laughs> that man's uh, dick is crazy. It just won't stop. Like the exit of a Chuck E. Cheese. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so uh, it, it makes like I think from a narrative point of view, it's brilliant that you had her be in this position because she gets to be the focal point for everybody else who was so used to the world around them. Like, you know, the, used to the world of The Last Airbender that when you get introduced to this huge time skip and all like the new technology, it's all as much a shock to her as it is to you. Yeah, that's a good point. And I like that. Yeah, so uh, she's experiencing all this new stuff as you're trying to get caught up on it because she's aware of the past. She grew up like, you know, uh, Katara was one of the people that raised her. So she knows everything that we know, uh, plus probably a little bit more about, you know, what happened afterwards. But honestly, that doesn't really matter. <laughs> uh, so you get introduced to the concepts as she gets used, introduced to them. And uh, 
like parts of the audience, she's kind of frustrated that she doesn't know what's going on and she doesn't have that sort of uh, level of spirituality and, you know, insight that uh, Aang had, being as he was raised as a monk uh, by all the monks. Yeah. And so she she's, you know, abrasive. She's very confident in her abilities because she mastered literally every other element except airbending by this point. Uh, by her words, with very little effort, like it, she was kind of a natural when it came to learning all these other forms. And so when she starts, you know, facing actual opposition, like you're not supposed to be here. You know, why aren't you learning this faster? She gets frustrated and upset that, you know, she's not living up to what she's supposed to be, which is why uh, leading over to Amon, he's such a good foil in the first season. Mm -hmm. Because he's, you know, <laughs> he's a much better version of the anti-Avatar than season two represents. Uh, uh, right. he, like, you know, representing this message to the common folk, but like, you know, you don't need bending to be special. In fact, you know, watch this. I, I, I can teach you how to beat any bender in one-on-one -on -one combat as long as you have, like, some tools at your disposal and you follow my, like, self-defense classes. And then he kind of shows himself to be this mystic-like person when he starts taking people's bending away. And he starts small, you know, with, like, little crime lords that are, you know, admittedly really good benders, but he keeps, like, going up and up until he takes out the winners of the pro-bending circle, and then he's up against the Avatar, and, you know, you, you actually feel him as a threat, and so does Korra, who is finally coming to terms with the fact that she doesn't know everything, she's not strong enough, and it's that humbling moment after, uh, after the duel on, well, quote unquote, duel on, uh, like Avatar Ang Island, the at the statue, where she really kind of changes, and that's where she starts to kind of become the Korra that she is for the rest of the series. Yeah, actually, that scene uh, at the Ang statue is one of the scariest, darkest scenes in the entire show, um, just because it is a moment where it's like, yeah, no. Not only is she out of her depth here, but she put herself in a situation where she could have honestly either died or kind of for the sake of the world worse. And even more so, she was kind of peer pressured into it. Yeah, uh, by by a character who in the first season I actually found quite interesting, Tarlock. Yeah, Tarlock. I so it's it's really interesting because between Am Amon and Tarlock. Tarlock is actually somewhat more of an interesting character for me, even if he's not as cool as Amon is. He's like, also significantly more evil. Yes. Generally, yes. Um, but Tarlock, uh, voiced by uh, the fish from American Dad, uh, is a really, really fascinating character because his entire, his entire motive... As he says, he's kind of like the opposite of of Amon. They both took these different ways that were shaped by earlier uh, by early events in their childhoods. That's really cool. I the uh, there's a lot about it's Tarlock is Klaus. Yes, Tarlock is Klaus. There's a lot that goes on with um. A lot of people talk about Amon's past and Tarlock's past, and a lot of them, mm. a lot of people, really do not like the explanation for Amon. I actually really like the explanation for Amon. The problem is that that needed to be the start of a story for him, not the whole thing. Because, and I, I wanna I want to finally touch on this, the plot of season one is a good idea, but the way they tell it sucks. Because they keep talking about benders are oppressing non-benders, they are the enemy, but there's very rarely any decent examples throughout that show that there is true inequality in the city. And Amon just kind of comes off as you know, like a, a person who is trying to take advantage of uh, a... People who feel powerless. He's, yeah, he's literally being a demagogue. And that that could have been interesting, but they never really go one way... Either, like, they never go enough in either direction with that. Because the idea that suddenly when it's revealed that, oh no, he's also a bender, if these people truly felt the way that they were supposed to, if they truly felt like they were being taken advantage of, they probably wouldn't have actually cared all that much. 
because Amon was still doing good. That probably wouldn't have actually changed their perspective. But the moment they find out he's a bender, oh, he's one of them. We can't trust this movement anymore. It came off as really kind of, oh, well, I guess that just solves that problem. Me admittedly, it is. It, admittedly, it is very odd that after season one, you see no signs of the equalist movement at all. Yeah, no, it's it's gone entirely, which is another problem. Again, th there, the series really suffers from being uh, as segmented as it is. Um, because and then and then you have the other direction of like, well, they want you to think that Amon has a point. The show actively wants you to think, hey, maybe Amon has a point. But no. At no point do you feel like Amon really truly has a point because the only person who's actually doing anything wrong is Tarlock. Um, and it's so cartoonishly over the top that, yeah, some kids might kind of catch the overall message. But if you if you look at it with an empirical eye, it just kind of comes off as trite. A little bit, yeah. Because, I mean, it's, it's very... You know, timely would be a good word for it, but, like, the way they uh, showed, like, as soon as uh, Lin Beifong stepped down as the chief, and I want to get into Lin, because I think uh, she is an awesome character. Lin is uh, one of the best characters in the entire... F Lin is one of the best characters in the fucking show. She really is. Uh, but she eventually, like, you know, after a whole bunch of the shit goes down, a bunch of, like, equalist you know, attacks are successful. She eventually steps down as the chief of police. Uh, and that's where Tarlock starts kind of like, you know, putting his own people in power and making moves that uh, for a while, actually, I thought he and Amon were working together, especially oh. after the reveal, because he was making all these moves that would make these non-benders absolutely hate benders. Yeah, because he's he's rounding them up, putting them into camps, cutting off their power, and just arresting them on mass for peacefully protesting, <laughs> timely, uh, just to yeah. you know serve <laughs> a fucking point, and just making Amon's point so much stronger, and maybe pushing more people to his side. Yeah. So and when it was actually when it was actually revealed, like when he showed up, um, after you know after Korra like goes to confront. Tarlock, and you know, we we learned that Tarlock is in fact a bloodbender and one of the strongest ones. Uh and you know, like beats her, takes her away, and like imprisons her in like a platinum cube, I guess. We see that Amon has come, like, and after he gets like busted for that, Amon shows up at his place. And I'm like, oh, here's the reveal where the, where we realize that they've been working together. And then Amon and his people just beat the shit out of him. It's like, oh, oh, oh okay. Yeah. And and again. So I want to, the way, uh, so I also want to talk a little bit more about Amon's past because I kind of glanced over it. Um, mm -hmm. The whole Yakon thing was yeah, told. Yeah, Yakon who uh, was like basically told in flashbacks to Korra as this gang lord crime boss who was so strong at bloodbending, like a prodigy. He was able to do it without the power of a full moon and Aang eventually had to take his bending away. I think the way that that story was told sucked. Like specifically that part of that story, the, the way that it was told sucked because- How would you it, how, how would you have told it? I would have definitely started seeding it a little bit earlier at the very least. Because as the way they, that it's- They, they kind of did give it in a, like a little bit of drops, but they did need to kind of give it all at once at some point. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's just, it's, it's kind of maybe hinted at and then suddenly, oh, here's it all. Korra can now just tap into it, which the progression of the story in the series is definitely rushing that first season, and you can tell that it definitely wanted more episodes just to kind of air that out a little bit. Um, and then we get the story about Yakon, who, when you first see it, you're not sure how it ties back into everything in a, in a significant way. Later, it does, but... I don't know. I, I did not like the way that it was written into the story. Uh, but then we find out that Yakon is Tarlock and uh, Noah Tox, or Amon's dad. And that story is interesting to me. I actually really liked that. I mean, besides mm -hmm. the fact that they apparently had really, really good plastic surgery back in what was a would have essentially been the turn of the century. Um, yeah, like 1900 basically in in our time yeah um but 
the idea, like, because everyone's like, oh, Amon just has daddy issues. And I'm like, well, it's a little more than that. Are, in, in something that I think people need to understand, uh, well, okay, that comes off as really condescending, and I apologize, but there's a lot of arguments to be made about how fathers affect their sons, about how our parents affect us in general. Um, and what Noah talk saw was, no, this is something that can be used to subjugate other people. And if you don't, you know, if you don't stand up against it, if you don't do what's necessary to stop it, you will be one of those people who is used and abused. Mm -hmm. And that is why that was such a really interesting moment. Like, I was like, oh, okay, so this all stems from a really personal place. This wasn't just a firebender killed my parents. It was my own father used this against me and made me hate the very thing that makes me strong. And I'm like, wow, that's a, that is such a cool fucking story. Oh man, wouldn't it have been great to learn more about how he struggled with that and how he grew. But you they, don't. They did, they did kind of do uh, like what Demon Slayer does. Uh, you know, a shout out to the Demon Slayer short we just put out. Go watch that if you haven't. Uh -huh. uh, where they just kind of give you all of the exposition for the main antagonist's like rights. I think both of them kind of in the same episode uh, of the season. Just kind of like, yeah, this is what happened to us. There you go. Yep. Isn't that sad? And now go that, fight him. And that, yeah, and that's the really frustrating thing of that. So fucking the uh, the the uh, Fire Lord was as two dimensional as they come, but he was also always supposed to be kind of a force of nature. He was never supposed to be this fully realized deep character. That's why you had Zuko. That's why you had Azula. Um, mm -hmm. Like you had those villains uh, slash you know villains turned heroes with real depth and interesting characters. Um, so when you had Amon, it's like, hey, you're really trying to give us this super, super interesting character, but you're, you've done it through flashbacks and you've given us a motivation that you don't actually expand, uh, expand upon. So by the time Amon's to be defeated, you don't really feel much of anything for him because you've taken away what made him so cool and, and, and mysterious and replaced it with a potentially interesting story that that's, that's just not developed. So by the time he's defeated, it's like, well, that was Amon, guys. Although I will say, nice boat. Oh yeah, the, the ending of their arc, uh, really strong. Uh, although if you do read into Amon like the way you did, like, you know, about like, how that psychologically affects yes it would be nice to be able to touch in on that a bit more uh but it's interesting to look at that and also see how tarlock kind of like the lessons he took from that as well after noah talk ran away to go live out his life mission tarlock kind of took the opposite message being like okay no i have this power that i'm able to use that you know i, I can use at a given moment to overpower any enemy i might come up with but like my father, I need to be. I, uh, but unlike my father, I need to be sneakier about it. Hmm. I need. I need to win people over. I need people to trust me. And so he takes like the almost the opposite method of uh, Amon in you know trying trying to work him his way up the ladder of the social like. Uh, up the ladder socially in Republic City until he's, you know, one of the lead councilmen of that city. Yep. So, uh, it, yeah, no, their, their stories are fascinating. And that's why I think that Tarlock was the more fascinating of those two characters because you spend so much more time with him and get to understand him. Like, that's why Tarlock is a better villain in the first season than Amon, even if Amon is significantly cooler for like 80% of the time of that, like 80% of that show. Also, yes. the fight between Tarlock and Korra is, oh my god, rewatching that gave me fucking goosebumps. Jesus. Yeah, with, with the, like with the waterfall in his office, just like, th like you know, putting up a shield, throwing uh, like fire, rapid firing like ice bullets at her. Yep. It's good shit, man. Also, like, also, this, the reveal, this show has some awesome action. And the reveal that he was a bloodbender came out so good. There, God, there's so many good scenes in that first season that, ah. Uh, First also, season also in, also introduces one of my favorite characters. 
probably possibly my favorite character of the entire show. Oh boy! Oh, hold on. We haven't said his name yet. Oh wait, no, no, we haven't said his name yet. Please don't we say. We have not. Bolin. Bolin. Oh my god! Of course, it's yeah. Bolin for you. I love Bolin. Bolin's awesome. Bolin is a uh, second-rate Sokka who. He, He's more than that, though. He really is. He, yeah. Okay. Look, he he has his problems, but I like. Every scene that Bolin is in, I feel like, uh, like okay, almost every scene that he's in, feels like it's slightly elevated by his presence. He's always kind of the third-rate character that's there, but his moments are strong, and he is he is best boy in that show. Come on. He is fine. Like, he's not Mako. <laughs> Bolin, yes, he is he's not, not Mako. Mako. Um, see, my, my issue ultimately with Bolin is that when he's introduced, actually, it's the same problem I have with Mako. When they are initially introduced, I was about them 100%. I'm like, okay, so Bolin is this well-meaning guy who really likes the fame that uh, Pro Bending gives him. Meanwhile, Mako is this guy who is focused only on the game and he has no time for any bullshit. And I'm like, okay, cool. I understand who these characters are. And then very quickly, they kind of start to feel like... I feel Bolin becomes less interesting and less like more of a doofus more of an idiot as the show goes on because they wanted that's, to give him all these really funny lines but all he comes off is somebody who is woefully out of his depth meanwhile zook uh like oh, that's because he's that's because he kind of super is despite being one of the better earthbenders out there yeah and i would have really liked if they'd given him a, something a little bit if they'd made him a little cooler he didn't need to be like oh i'm the cool guy who always does things right but he could have been one of those guys who's like, no, I, I have these really cool skills that I know how to use. And even if I am a little bit silly and stupid, I can kick some ass. But it felt See, like most of the time he was just kind of like barely getting by and also never contributing anything to conversation. Except for like, again, he's funny, but very rarely I, does he actually help with the plot. I I. I I disagree, because uh, to me, I, I always kind of look at Bolin like, um, the difference between Bolin and Mako are kind of the difference between Jackie Chan and Jet Li. Yeah. Where, where Mako is just very serious, I'm gonna get this done, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm hyper-focused, you know, being Discount Zuko and all that, and, uh, Bolin, on the other hand, is always on the back foot just looking for something that will give him an edge, and he always manages to find it. It's it's that interesting uh, dynamic, and, and I like characters like that, that are basically out of their depth in terms of, like, you know, what they're trying to go with. And yes, he's a bit of a dupus. A doof, a dupus. He's a duper. A duper. Uh, but, yeah, he's a big old duper. But he's also not like he's not meant to be a smart guy he's not meant to be a Sokka who is like you know a brilliant strategist oh, I, I definitely didn't need that yeah uh he is emotion like he is he is a soft boy he's yeah, a soft no, boy and, and you know he is a soft boy he's a very soft boy and that's fine I'm, I'm okay with him being the soft boy but again, he's so annoying throughout the entire show because there will be these moments that are, no, it's like, shut up, Bolin, this is serious. Stop saying stupid things during these moments where we need to plan something legitimate. And that's the it's thing that killed it's, me. It's, unfo it's unfortunate, though, that you're talking about this on a show that's on Nickelodeon because there's always going to be, like, there, there's going to be kind of a need for that on those shows, especially when you got, like, network executives talking in your ear where it's yeah. like, I, I don't know, well, where's the okay. funny? So, so the issue that you find with that is that in... And I, I, I'm sorry to make the comparison. I know they're two different shows, but in Avatar... You mm -hmm. had a couple of different characters who actually provided the funny. You had Toph, you had Aang, who was, you know, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm funny in my own, like, he's, he's, you know. He's, yeah, he's, he's, he's lighthearted and goofy. Yeah, and then you had Sokka. Sokka was more sarcasm and sometimes not stupid, but like a little goofy. You had Toph, who was pure sarcasm and, um, and just basically. Sar sardonicism. Yeah, and, and snark. And then you had Aang, who's light spirited and happy and a little goofy. Yeah, you had these... and, and what you're and what you're saying is, unfortunately, all of these are kind of all wrapped up into Bolin. 
yeah, Bolin has to carry the load on that one. He's like, I, I have to be the guy who's providing the laughter every time because Mako's certainly not. Korra can be funny, but only from a, uh, only, only sometimes. And Asami, no. <laughs> Yeah, As Asami, who, uh, watching through the show, uh, again, kind of going into spoilers, I, I watched it through the lens of, okay, I want to see how Asami and Korra actually kind of start to get along, you know? Yeah. Asami is actually a very interesting and, and far more nuanced character than I gave her credit for originally. Like, she, she doesn't have, like, the yucks, she doesn't have a whole lot going on, but she plays this role like she's... I, the comparison I made in my head is she's basically the Bulma of the group if Bulma knew how to fight. I, see, Asami was one of those characters that I actually desperately wanted them to develop more. Uh, and they do a little bit more in seasons three and four. But man, yes. so in season one, she gets fucked. And in season two, it's even worse. It's I cannot believe how badly the show treats Asami in its first two seasons because she is a character season, that is season two. She's literally only treated as the love triangle character, and then season it, one she she's introduced as it, but at least she's shown to be like an actual competent martial artist. Yes, it, and that's good. I'm I'm very glad that Asami gets to stand on her own. But man, season two fucked her so bad. Like, the fact that it's like, oh, she's back in a relationship with Mako. Kinda. Oh, and then no, she's not, because Korra lost her memory, and, Mako's a, and Mako doesn't feel like right now is the right time to mention that they broke up. And then it's never addressed again. You just get a dirty look from Asami, and then she's a non-character for the rest of that season. And it's, holy shit. Like, I couldn't believe how badly Asami got just... I, I, season two dicks over every character, though. Season two, season two is just kind of the worst. It, it really is. Like <laughs> it, it, it takes all of the stuff that you like were introduced to and actually kind of liked about season one, uh, and just kind of makes the characters a bit worse. Yeah. Like it, it, it treats Tenzin poorly. Uh, oh even yeah. Though kinda, it, it, even though I think season two is kind of where Tenzin develops. No, season three is where he develops the most. Uh, but he actually gets a little bit of development in season two. Which, uh, you know, I actually really like J.K. Simmons' Tenzin. Like, he's... Oh, yeah. No, he's, he's great. He's fantastic. Uh, he's fun. Um, but uh, Lynn in season two is th fucking terrible. She has, like, nothing to do in season two. Yeah, and she's also an idiot. She uh, er, Okay, season two is where everybody holds the idiot box. Because the only way that, like, Korra has character... Like, literally... Her character is basically. Uh, her characters. Her, her characters regressed. don't tell me what. Her, yeah, her characters don't tell me what to do. Yeah, and it's like Cora, you literally just went through a bunch of really serious events that taught you don't act like this, and then she acts like this, and it's like, what the fuck are you doing? Also, the oh, the Mako Cora stuff was never at its worst until season two. Like it, that was. Oh my god, that was awful! Holy shit! Yeah. Like, uh, like that is the worst. And everyone says, oh, but they're supposed to be a bad couple. Then, st like, but but then stop stop showing them as a couple all the time. Stop it. Just do don't make that a huge fucking point part of the show. Stop making a huge part of Cora's character being her terrible relationship with this dude. It is not fun to watch. It is not entertaining. There is nothing to be drawn from this other than Cora's sort of a total bitch to Mako and Mako's a wimp. Yeah, Mako's pretty one note throughout the entire show. Like, I don't think he, like, he might have, like, I, I think he has, like, a small character arc, but from point A to all the way to the end, he's kind of the same guy. Yeah, Just actually, by Mako's the end, character. By the end, he's a cop. Like, I don't know. Yeah, Mako's character, Mako sucks. Mako sucks from top to bottom because Mako could have been interesting if they had actually kept with the characterization they did when they first introduced him. Honestly, I, it would not have been a bad thing if he'd kind of been Zuko 2.0, where he'd just been like, no, I don't have time for this. You're acting stupid. He needed to be more mean and more of an asshole. Like, if they had really leaned into that angle of, no, I grew up on the streets. This shit sucks. The world sucks. And I'm here, like, this stuff is all I have. And it's the only thing that makes me happy. And I'm here to protect That's my brother. 
And, that but, sounds equally shitty, though. I wouldn't want to be around a character like that every season. Yeah, but at least they could have made him like they he he could have been he could have been sardonic. He could have been c- cynical. He could have had a character outside. He could have had a character. Like, Mako yeah, doesn't like have a character, and that sucks. But at least a jerkass is somebody that you can develop over time. Especially because he's, like, his name is a tribute to, like, you know, the fantastic voice actor of the original Iroh. Yep. Like, I I remember watching the first, like, season, and, like, just all the way through, I'm just like, wow, this, this like, they're, they're really, like, throwing some, like, shade at Mako here. What What the hell? Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, season two is a, is a travesty top to bottom. So, by the way, for anybody who doesn't know, um, season two was actually animated, uh, by Studio Mir and Studio Pierrot. Um, the first several episodes, I think it's one through six and episode nine are Pierrot, while the rest of them are Studio Mir, the original studio who, uh, does basically every other season of the show. Um, and it's, uh, it's a little noticeable, like Studio Pierrot does the best that it can, uh, but if you if you were to compare the episodes, you'd really see the difference in uh, how the characters stay on model, the quality of the animation, and the compositing. Um, that was one thing that I noticed immediately with season two. That was also very fascinating for me because I was like, oh, wow, this is a Japanese studio and a South Korean studio uh, working together on the same show. Um, and the plot is... <sighs> Unalak is Tarlock 2.0. And he's so much worse. He's so bad that in the season four episode where they decide to recap everything, he's 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 given he's given the nobody likes you treatment. Like the, the entire season is just so weird. Like it introduces it introduces some really interesting concepts, like uh like the entire spiritual side. It gives Jinora some uh care like it gives Jinora and Tenzin some uh characterization air- some some growth oh yeah the airbending uh, family benefits the most from season two in fact mm-hmm. by and large god i i remember watching that season like can we please just stick with tenzin and his family this is so much more interesting than everything that's going on with cora and mako and bolin and oh my god and it does give us spirit world iro it does introduce us to the spirit world which is uh, admittedly like you know, it, it's admittedly kind of like a cool concept cool idea that you have like this this gateway to a, an entire other realm where uh, I guess I guess part of the season is just an isekai but uh the concept of literally there being this opposite force to what the avatar is I think is uh what you were referring to when I when I was talking about metachlorians the demystification of what the avatar is and <laughs> it comes in actually my favorite episodes of season <laughs> two which is all the stuff about avatar one oh. the first avatar i think that is some of the like i think it is like the best part of season two to me i i really like stuff like that where, where it basically gives you a wiki dump and you are grumbling really hard I'll let you burst into this in a second, but but let me just talk about how I liked it. Go ahead. I, like I they... want to hear your perspective on this one, buddy. I'm sure you do. I like that they changed the animation style. I like that they, like, you know, give you this idea of, like, yeah, you know, once the world and the spirit world, like, you know, the, the human world and the spirit world were, you know, easily accessed by one another, and the only way that men were able to travel out and not get murdered by these massive monstrous spirits was by uh, being gifted the power of the elements. Uh, I don't necessarily think that they needed to be lion turtles, but hey, you needed to tie it into the first season somehow. So the lion turtles give the humans the ability to harvest the elements. And that's where like, you know, Juan just being this kind of Aladdin-like character goes out just like, yeah, you know what? I, I'm not going to live here anymore. I'm just going to go live in, live with the spirits, be one with the world. And I, I legitimately liked his adventure. I, I liked the way it played out, even though it was shorter than I might have liked, actually. I, I think if you had given it more time to pan out, you probably could have delved a bit deeper into some of the themes they were playing with. But I, it's something that I genuinely enjoyed. I, I, I kind of like things like that, especially when you compare it to everything that's surrounding it. Now go ahead and rip my rip, rip me to pieces. Huh. 
Um, so, uh, I should note that when I talk passionately about some things, I can come off as really condescending. And I do want to, I, I do acknowledge that, uh, it is not something that I really like about myself. Uh, and I'm really sorry if I ever come off as me acting like I know better than you, or I'm right and you're wrong. Um, I really do apologize. That is not something I like to do. Uh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> that said... Uh, I also want to acknowledge that these episodes, the one episodes are gorgeous, like amazingly beautifully animated. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I the, love the art style. It's almost got this kind of watercolor palette to it. Yeah, this was this was the first episodes that Studio Mirror did in season two. And I'm really, really glad that these were the episodes that they did, because I don't even want to imagine what would have happened if Piero had to have changed their style up this much. Um, the... And, 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 and it's not just, like, I love the way the bending looks. It's so cool. And the spirits are all so heavily Miyazaki-inspired. And that's fine. I, I'm really okay with the fact that they just basically ripped off Miyazaki whole hog for all of its spirit designs. That's, mm. they look great. The spirit world looks great. Um, and uh, I love the design of Juan. Uh, and yeah, you're right. He's kind of this Aladdin character. And that's that's neat. That's very interesting. Um, the story's awful. It's awful. It's so bad. Um, and not because it's not an interesting story in its own right, but what it does to Avatar is so frustrating for me. It is so... Rava and Vatu are, are awful. Yes, I, I, I agree. If you got rid of the Rava and Vatu part, I'd be much happier. I, I could, but. I could, I think the rest of it could have worked. Getting... Bending from the lion turtles made bending feel stolen. It made it feel unnatural, and it really makes it feel like there shouldn't be benders. It's like, are you kidding me? You're you're telling me that bending did not come across naturally, and the idea that the first series gave us of they learn like they were taught bending from the dragons, from the lion turtle, uh, from uh, from the uh, badger moles, etc isn't exactly true like yeah now we are now we're led to believe that oh they learned how to use it from them but they gained the ability from the lion turtles which again it feels unnatural it feels like it's changed a major part of what we understand with this universe and again it makes the benders feel like they shouldn't they don't belong i i hated that i was like oh my god benders shouldn't exist they are against the natural order and then we find out that the Avatar is also against the natural order. He basically came in and fucked with Rava and Vatu while they were having their fight. Uh, which, by the way, Rava and Vatu are designed very intentionally after uh, Taoist, the Taoist yin and yang. Which, mm -hmm. by the way, that is not how yin and yang work at all. Uh, Rava uh, basically like, I am the light. And Vatu being, I am the dark. And it's like, that's... Um, no, the the entire point is the little dots inside of each of them. Yeah, and it's like, guys, that's not how Taoism works. You, you, you've basically just set up God and Satan, and now the Avatar has to literally become Jesus Christ. What are you doing? Why are you changing this? Why are you making this? It, this, Vatu is stupid as hell. Sorry, there's no such thing as the darkness in evil that's the entire point behind tau like the the yin and yang there's no such thing as absolute evil and absolute good you can't have that so the idea that like yep like the darkness is going to take over and plunge everything into uh, into darkness and oblivion what the fuck this what is this kingdom hearts bullshit uh, but even kingdom hearts still had the fucking uh wherewithal to be like oh actually no in the darkness they're still good it's there's it's not so plain it's not so simple and i i just i hated it i i actively was like this is really gorgeous but this is also bullshit like you're you've given us you've given us satan in a in a world that has up to up till now been a story about how everything is complex nothing is so simple and clean so yeah. i no I, I i agree with that i think the rava and vatu stuff is just easily the weakest stuff and unfortunately something that kind of taints it forever more but it's also something that i kind of accepted it's just like okay well you know this is you know by the way that they were explaining it uh which is which is a problem when you try to over explain fantasy 
you always run into problems. Yeah. Th- like, because why, every- why do I yeah. need to know how the magic's made? Fuck you. That's not what I wanted. Because the only way that the Avatar can exist is because Rava is the one that is channeling all of the different elements. Because no human body can hold all of them at the same time. So it needs to be Rava's spirit within a human body. And then Rava is the one, you know, the spirit that just kind of links all the avatars. And then it does further damage to Avatar in the climax when finally evil water... Unavatu. Sure. Uh, Korra's uncle uh, has absorbed Rava and... Or, sorry, what's the other one? Vatu. He's absorbed Vatu, Vatu and he beats the living yeah, shit out of Korra and then rips out... Beats the shit out, out of Korra, rips out Rava and literally kills the souls of all the ever avatars, or at least unlinks them from yeah. Rava. Severs, so se- now, severs now the link. Korra is, yeah, Korra is now just alone. The the new avatar, and like the first of this new line of avatars. It's just like, why? Why why do that? Yeah. Why? And, and the, the worst part is it's like, it's, Okay, so the idea of like, this big tragedy, that's such an interesting idea. It's not even one I, de- de- like, ultimately dislike, but Unalak does it. I'm sorry, I can't get past the fact that Unalak, this shitty, terrible villain, and he really is terrible, which is only made worse by the fact that he actually starts out with the possibility of being absolutely one of the best. Mm. But this awful villain, with an awful idea, ends up ruining a huge part of the lore and shrinks down the story by separating her from her past lives. Now, we don't know if it's forever. Ultimately, I feel like there could definitely be a story, there could have been a story. We, we kind of we kind of do know it's forever by now, though, because nothing ever comes of it. Like, well, we, well like, remember it's done. the, it's done. I should point out that the Korra comics are still happening. Whatever. I mean, it, who knows? Um, but yeah, that, that really sucked. I, I remember watching that. I'm like, this is, this is just sad. I'm not really interested in this now. Like, I, I, I felt. Hold on. Oh wow. Okay. So apparently they've they confirmed that she'll never get that link back. So yeah. that's great. That's fantastic. That actually makes it's, me it's sad what, it's, more than anything. It's what, I, it's, it's what I expected, though. I mean. Season two to Avatar is the most cataclysmic thing that ever happens, for good or bad. Because there is some good that comes from it, but my god is the season just bad. Even its B-plots are like super weak. Uh, like it introduces one of the other best characters of the show, Varric. Oh, oh, we haven't talked about Varric and I feel really bad about that. We have not talked about Varric. He gets Ugh. introduced this season as, you know, just a... Just a, just a mogul, somebody who wants to make money in any way, and he, he comes across as, like, really shady, and in fact, he kind of is, but he still has, like, he means well, but he he does bad things for good reasons. So, oh, man. Okay, Varric is okay, frustrating. Kai, okay, me. yeah, Kaiser, do the thing. Okay, Varric, appreciate mm-hmm. Varric is frustrating for me because, actually... The moment he's introduced, I was like, okay, you can go one of two ways, motherfucker. And then he goes heavy in one direction of just being entertaining and funny and enjoyable. But then they did something where, uh, you know, Mako runs into Asami's room to be like, I found out what happened. And then fucking Varric just turns around and grins at him. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. oh shit, this is great. Varric villain turn, let's do this. Yeah, and, I loved that. I, but, I, I loved the uh, I loved the heel turn. But then nothing really comes of it. Like uh, he is, he definitely ends up becoming kind of a villain. Um, he tries to fucking uh, steal the president. He's, but they yeah, also he's, he's he's a puckish rogue. Yes, is what you would say. Like but, he's he's chaotic neutral. But I was hoping that they were gonna drop that the puckish rogue part and just have him be like full on like, no, you don't understand how this business works, buddy. Like he even does that. He even has that moment where he has Mako alone, and he's like, "I'm just saying, things can happen, man." And then he... I was wait, I I was waiting for him to go like full blown evil, and also kind of dreading it because I do think that having him be this like ultimately well meaning but also extremely selfish and narrow minded person is 
good. I, I think I think that's a much better character than it going full one way or the other. I mean, you're not you, okay. You you might be right in that regard. It was something that I wanted, and they kind of hinted at. When I didn't get it, I was frustrated. I will say, in the later seasons, he does have a lot of really funny moments. And mm -hmm. if it weren't for the fact that he is he is just the telltale like model of the capitalist genius who's you know who basically he's a lot like tony stark only he never gets uh, he doesn't properly get humbled until like the fourth season and there's no real development that leads up to it um, he's, he's tony stark if you crossed him with han solo like the the kind of like oafishness of han solo yeah and and it, it, and it frustrated me a little bit like okay i guess for all the terrible things you did you're never actually gonna pay for them so he just kind of gets off really easy. He he was a bad guy who did bad things, but because he's comic relief, he just kind of gets to exist and continue doing the things he does until the until Hitler requires him. Literal Hitler requires him to grow a conscience. He specked high in luck <laughs> and right. intelligence, pretty much. Um, which, by the way, uh, we haven't touched on Kuvira. Well, Kuvira is season four. Yeah, yeah, it's we true. We still need to talk about the fact that, like, one of the things about season two that made it so cataclysmic was the fact that they literally left the spirit world open, which is what they dealt with in season three. As leaving the spirit world open, all of the airbender, like, airbending started coming back into the world somehow. Which, which uh, actually, I'm about. I'm no, about I, that. I'm absolutely about it, but after going through this whole line of explaining how this shit happens, and then people just mysteriously start getting airbending, I don't know, you think a couple more waterbenders and firebenders might pop up as well, but I guess that wouldn't make the news. Uh, so, airbending starts coming back, and it's uh, the first person that you experience it with is one of Aang's children, Boomy, who up to this <sighs> point was seen as like not being a bender at all. Uh, and uh, touching on Aang's children, that came out wrong. Uh, <laughs> I want to, I want to <laughs> talk about the fact that it actually really gave some interesting depth to some of the characters in the original season because uh, in the Last Airbender, because it starts to paint them as imperfect characters, like Aang, pretty shitty dad. Oh my God! Yeah. Okay. So Aang being a bad dad is su such a good fucking f like wrinkle for him it makes sense it it like because of how he was raised and what he needed to do for the future he puts a lot of his time into tenzin and lets his other kids kind of like L lets them to katara like he takes tenzin out on all these amazing like you know training vacations like here this is like you know i'm gonna show you everything about the air nation because you're going to need to learn it because you're like you're you're the only child that i had that can airbend so yeah. you know you it's up to you to carry this on so he put all of his attention on tenzin taking him out on all these uh i guess tenzin called them like field trips or vacations out to all these like amazing places where Ang could teach him about airbending, about uh, air nomad society, and none of his other children got that. Yeah, and it's and, while, that and while they still and while they still love their dad, and he still obviously loved them, it was clear that it was very much a like you know Tenzin is the fav the golden child scenario. Yeah, and and that's it's some people say like oh man ang's a horrible dad no ang wasn't a horrible dad horrible dads hurt their children he a, intentionally yeah, he was a he was a flawed dad yeah he was a flawed dad and and the idea that his, his one of his biggest failings was being like the dad that they all needed that's really interesting like like he uh, it's never really indicated that he hurt his children he just neglected two of them because he was so focused on something that was to be fair bigger than all of them it doesn't excuse it, but it does explain it, and that's why it's so interesting. Like, and that's why I love, I love that that foil for him. I love, I love that wrinkle. What a, what a great, interesting idea. That's why when they introduced that in season two, I was, I, oh, I just, again, I wanted to spend more time with them. Also, one thing and about this show that I want to point out that uh, hurt it, uh, like all top to bottom, the cast in this show is too big. It is it is massive. You have like a nearly a one piece size cast in this motherfucker. Yeah, there are too many characters for as short as this show is who all have the characters and speaking parts and there's just it's really frustrating because you have Tenzin 
and his family, his direct family, not his wife and his kids. You have his kids. You have Korra, Mako, Bolin, and Asami. Then you have all of the villains. Then you have the supporting cast. Then you have the returning cast. Then you have the people related to the villains. There are so many characters yeah. in so little time. It's like, it is so hard to actually focus on developing anyone's story that it's kind of, it, it's really sad that Lin Beifong gets more development than Mako. Yeah, I mean, I. it's nice that she does, though. I like Lin. Yes, because Lin Beifong Lin, is the best character in the show. Don't at me. She's certainly one of them. We actually get introduced to her family in season three while everybody's out looking for airbenders because one of the airbenders happens to be uh, Lin's, I guess, half niece. And it's, it's another interesting wrinkle that you get from these, like the previous cast. Uh, Toph got her fuck on, man. Like she, yeah. she, she, had, she had multiple partners. I love the fact that Toph that, wouldn't settle down. <laughs> yeah, uh, Lin and Su Yin, the Beifong sisters, both have different fathers. Like, oh. I, I loved that. Because it's not like, you know, they're, oh, they were, you know, sisters and they grew up in the same house, which, you know, they did. But neither of them got to know their father because Toph is just like, eh, I, I got more important shit to do. I'm making police. Yeah. And so, so like, you know, she, she'd, she'd go out a night of clubbing. She'd end up with a guy. She'd, you know, use him, abuse him, throw him away and just. I mean, we don't know that's how it children. happened, but. She, she definitely. She, uh, one one thing she does say is just like, eh, what's to say, your father? I met him once, and you know, we we didn't end up getting along, and he left. That's all it was. Well, okay, no. What she said was he was a nice man, but it didn't work out. Yeah. Like it, it wasn't a one night stand, but it also wasn't something that she was interested in. The guy was probably for her too clingy, and that's really interesting to me that she was like, yeah, it just it didn't work out, and I didn't care, but she doesn't really understand that no her kids care and she needed to care about how her kids would feel and she didn't and, yeah. and again it's it's it makes sense with a character like Toph and Toph yeah, was a bad Toph, Toph yes Toph was a bad mother like yeah. she she did not take enough of an interest in either child she cared about what like it was that she was doing and what that represented and, you know, like the one that's uh, Lynn, who's following the rules, doing everything she needs to to make her mother proud, ultimately just kind of like, yeah, no, you're doing a good job, whatever. And then Su Yin, who is breaking all the rules, being the rebel, breaking the law, and Toph ends up covering for her and just says, OK, look, you need to leave the city. OK, you, you just need to go. Go go stay with, I don't know, your uncle or somebody. I, I don't fucking know. And she goes out traveling the world, literally joining a circus. You get introduced to Su Yin, and uh, to touch back in on the point that you made that the cast is too fucking big, her whole fucking family. <laughs> oh my god, yeah. They were introduced to the whole Beifong family! And, uh, she's got this beautiful life. Like, uh, she built an entire city, she... She created an art form out of metal bending, as well as like an amazing defense force. Like the, the cities have these like metal flower petals that extend and retract at night to create these domes. Yeah, she gentrified like, the fuck out of that place. Holy shit. She built the place. Yeah. Like the place did she not built exist this until city. she did. Yeah. She built this city with metal and her fuck boy. Yeah. Which, <laughs> and, oh man. And then her son, voiced by Todd Habercorn. Oh, wait, mm -hmm. uh, was that? Yeah, yeah, that was her son. Oh, my uh, God. So you get introduced to them, and while all these uh, airbenders are getting recruited, a religious zealot who absolutely adores all things airbending, who also really, really wants to kill Korra and, you know, break the cycle, break the Avatar, uh, Zaheer, in my opinion, well, my, my favorite, at least, villain in the series gets access to airbending. Yeah. And holy shit, Zaheer. Like, yeah. him and his crew are actually some of the most interesting villains we get, too. Because, <laughs> like, we we actually get moments of levity with them, which we don't get with a lot of the other villains. Oh my god, right? How amazing is it that there are moments where the villains are just hanging out with the heroes at some points, and it's like, yeah, yeah, we're the best villains, but we also have kind of our own thing going on, so... One of my, one of my favorite moments was... Um, when they're just kind of traveling in the van, 
Uh, what was it? I, I think it was Bolin that they kidnapped. It was Bolin, Bolin and Mako. Yeah, and, and Bolin Mako's and Mako. Like, Would you stop making friends with the people kidnapping and, us? And Bolin's just looking at it like, okay, I'm gonna take a guess at do you. Do you guys ever just like you know make up stories for people? I'm gonna take a guess at you. Uh, you were raised by your sister in a in a very poor upbringing. Uh, you have you have a uh, your mustache you very, came in when you were yeah. a kid, and yeah, your mustache came in when you were ten years old, and you two have an unspoken romance thing going on. They like the two characters just kind of look at each other, kind of blush a little. Two out of three, not bad. <laughs> two out of three, like, not bad, kid. <laughs> I love uh, that that moment. See, and that's that's sort of the frustrating thing about Cora is that I would have loved more moments like that. It was mm -hmm. there was only a few scenes where these characters actually get to be characters, and when they are. I actually really enjoyed them. But Zaheer is the only guy who really gets to be a character throughout it. And um, so Zaheer is voiced by Henry Rollins. Uh, he uh, is he, like, he, he's effectively the head of a group known as the Red Lotus, which is, you know, dumb as hell. Kind of, it, it's it's a dumb <laughs> as hell group. Like the, their entire thing is like anarchy, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. Fuck the establishment. I don't know. I, I like the uh, idea of the Red Lotus on paper. But it, 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 nothing comes of it. It's like, by the way, there's the Red Lotus. We and, uh, and we're going to only exist also, for this yeah, one also, season. Also, also, your uncle was a part of it, I guess. Because eh. we have to tie back in, tie him back in somehow. It doesn't matter. Look, we're the Red Lotus, and we're here to end the Avatar cycle. And it's like, okay, well, that's sort of an interesting idea. Um, hey, Zaheer, uh, is your plan dumb as hell? Oh, it is. It's incredibly stupid and poorly planned out. And your idea of anarchy makes no fucking sense. That's cool. At least you're really awesome in your airbending fights and you have neat speeches and you kill the Earth Queen in an amazingly cathartic but ultimately pointless scene. That's neat. Also, like, also, like the most graphic death we get in this show. Like, oh, this, yeah. this season has yeah. the most graphic deaths we get in this show. They aren't bloody. They aren't, like, on-screen violent. But, oh my god, are they visceral. Uh, I, 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 I also give them credit because Zaheer's a kind of short guy dating a very tall girl and like it's... Oh yeah, Polly. Like it's really it's really cool seeing that as an aspect in one of these shows. It's, it's not like a big thing, but it's just like a little detail. It's like, oh, that's cute. Look at him. He's like 5'7". And she's like 6'2". Hey, hey, he's, hey. He's, he's, he's short kings short, short kings can deserve tall queens. Hell yeah. A absolutely. And I, I love the little, I love the relationship between the four anarchists, the four red lotus, uh, the lava bending dude, the girl that like the, the water bender that literally just oh, makes yeah. Fucking, uh, water whips out oh, into her limbs. What's her damn name? I, I feel bad. I don't know any of their names. Oh yeah. I, <laughs> I know Zaheer. I, oh, I knew, I knew Pali, Pali Zaheer and uh, Mingwa. Ming, Mingwa? I, I don't, I, I sure. fuck. But Ming, yeah, Mingwa. Okay, cool. I was right. Um, Mingwa is um wow like one of the things that i do love in avatar the last airbender is when they take physical disabilities and then supplant them with bending she's a mm. she's a um uh oh paraplegic she has no arms but that just made her more terrifying she's yeah, just like, scarier like her, because her of it her control over those water whips, like literally being able to like whip them around, turning just the tips into ice so she can get a grip and like moving with them. It's it's so fucking cool. Like this is easily the best group of villains we get throughout the show. As, as much as I think uh, Amon is more iconic, Zaheer's crew is way cooler. Yeah, no, Zaheer's crew is a fucking, the, they're the anti-gang and they're amazing. But I can't get past, okay, so I... I love them, they're entertaining, they're cool, but I will say Zaheer's plan was was dumb as bricks. And it, no, it, 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 like the entire season goes way downhill in the last two episodes. It, in, it, yeah, in the last several episodes, like his whole thing, like there will be no kings and queens. Man's allegiance will only be to himself and the people he loves. And it's like, okay, so by the way, that's some... Um, that's not that's how never anarchy, how any, that's that, never how anything works. Yeah, that's not how anarchy works. Like the the idea, the the philosophical concept of anarchy, um, like you have anarcho communism and anar anarcho capitalism, and anarcho capitalism is more individualistic. Anarcho communism, though, is what he constantly seems to espouse. But anarcho communism isn't about like oh you're only out for yourself and we basically destroy all forms of uh, of government and let everything literally devolve into chaos like that's not that's and, and look I understand if they're if they didn't want to actually involve real true 
uh, anarchy in there, but like, his idea was literally, I'm just gonna fuck everything up and cause way more death in the progress, but now we're not gonna have queens and kings. Okay. The thing is, like, the, the, enti- the show's entire, like, the, the entire world encyclopedia, uh, governance was always the thing explained the least, because it's the thing that least needed to be expunded upon. Uh, yeah. I- at least in this season. Uh, like, it- it's implied that Republic City is some form of democracy and that the Earth Kingdom is a monarchy, but that's about as far as they go into it. They don't really go into the bureaucracy of it all. Yeah, and, 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 so, and, that's and so, why... so it's very so it's very easy just to say kill all the leaders, let everybody else decide what happens. Yeah, and it's just it. That's why it was like it's a really messy idea, and and you don't get a great idea of what here is really all about because by the end of it, he just kind of seems like a crazy idiot. Like, and and, and, that, and, and and that actually really plays into it, though. Like, he, he's a zealot. He is bought whole hog into this idea that he has in his head, and now he literally believes as a sign from God he is meant to do it because he's been given these earth, like, these airbending power that nobody, like, that everybody else thought was just gone. Yeah. And so, that's, like, yeah. he is whole hog in his beliefs. Like, no, now now I know we have to do it. This is a sign from some sort of divine being. We we are doing this, and he becomes literally the best airbender we ever see. Oh, yeah, he might be one of the best airbenders that ever lived. Like, he, he attains an ability that was only kind of like a, a legend to airbenders. He attains the ability to fly after one of the... Most Darkest, brutal most brutal, deaths. most metal scenes. Holy shit. When, like, uh, I, I think it's Su Yin or Lin. Yeah, no, it's a metal plate around his uh, girlfriend's head. And she's one of the combustion benders. They can like make explosions fire out of her face. Yeah. Wraps it around her face and boom, you just hear a pop. No, you, you actually don't hear the her pop. Her head is gone. You, you, I, you actually don't hear the pop. Um, in my head, I heard the pop. Uh, you you hear you hear a metal noise, but it's also very subdued because they did not want to elaborate. No, they, 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 cut, they, they cut away to uh, Zahir's perspective when you hear the tang, which is yeah. what I meant when I said pop. Yeah. Uh, and then you see him turn so, around so and then like, you see the fucking what? smoke. And because of that, he is able to literally let go of all earthly possessions. She was the one thing he had left that he was clinging to in his mortal form. And he is able to fly. Like, it's it's such a powerful, cool moment. But it's unfortunate from then on, we kind of learn what his plan was, which is, uh, I'm going to, you know, give you mercury poisoning and then kill you while you're in the Avatar state. That's it. Well, I mean, that, okay, that, that, that plan is, like fascinating i, I, I was like sense. what a, like, what a you know, cool you, idea for, but... force them into the avatar state by poisoning and then kill them but it, you know you, you force them into the avatar state and now they're the most most powerful being on the planet so good luck yeah and that's and that's that's sort of again it's frustrating because again by the end of it uh zahir's zahir's idea of how to fix society is dumb as hell and doesn't and it would obviously not even come close to working, uh, which really ultimately undermines him as being this really cool, interesting villain. The fascinating part about that is when it comes back later, and the look on his face when he realizes how dumb he really was is actually al- almost makes up for it in a way. I do like that they don't kill him off, that they allow him to come back next season. Yeah. Also, I'll, I'll say the way that they beat Zaheer was... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah okay. Well, it's I, it's, it's oh, one of those things that, like... There's never been this many earthbender, uh, airbenders here in a long time either. We're gonna make a tornado. Okay, what was your plan with the tornado? I mean... Yeah, it's like, okay. You, you, I, the, that's, that's the ultimate failing of Zaheer, is... Uh, I can remember how literally every other villain is defeated. Even after just having binged through it, like, the latter part of last week... I forgot about all the airbenders in the tornado. I literally forgot how he <laughs> lost. Uh, yeah, actually, I won't lie. When I was rewatching the fight, I, I, I rewatched the fight a little while back before it was back on Netflix, and I was like, "Oh right, I forgot Janor and the other airbenders had a had a thing. Actually, had a, a part to play in in winning. That's 
That's neat. Oh my god, we forgot about Kai. Kai's a character. Kai exists. Kai's also kind of cool. I I, I, I I liked him as an introduction, like as uh, as the plot device that he played in uncovering what was happening in the Earth Kingdom. I felt like he served his purpose. Uh, I think that, like you know they don't do literally anything with him in season four other than yeah he's one of the better Airbenders. That he's they got. she's Janora's boyfriend and she's also yeah, one of the that's he, yeah that's that's literally all he has in season four. See it's, it's, it's kind it's kind of what he has in season three too like that that that. Uh, budding relationship between him and Jinora. Uh but it's 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 all right. I mean, I I like that. I like that it gives some dynamicism to Bolin and Mako, who grew up in a very similar situation to him. It allows them to kind of flesh out their past a little bit more. But due to Mako being Mako, it gives way more development to Bolin than to either than to the other. Oh yeah, <sighs> due to Mako again being Mako. I, Which is I, weird I, because at this point, Mako would have, Mako really could have served from some development with Kai because Mako by this point had been in Kai's shoes and has at by now he's literally the the top detective in uh, Republic City. So he is he has literally been where he is and traveled along a path that got him to you know being the complete opposite of that. Yeah, but they do nothing with it, like next to nothing other than Kai pulling one over on Mako again and again. But don't worry, in season four, he does even less as Prince Wu's bodyguard. Oh my god. Yeah, uh, so... One, one other, oh, oh, go one ahead. Other thing go I, one other thing I wanted to touch on in season three, just, just a little bit, uh, uh, was the fact that we do get introduced to season four's villain ahead of time. Which I thought was kind of neat, but the instant they show up, call me Ku, yeah, call me Kuvira. It's like they they got this from this like upward angle. Like she looks menacing. They may as well have been playing like the violent violin in the background, where it's like, okay, so are yeah. you evil? <laughs> no, I remember seeing that scene too, and I'm like, why are they? Why is the camera focused on her? What is happening? I was so confused. I'm like, is this character important? We're on the last episode of the season. What the fuck is going on? And they do end in a very interesting place that they... Oh, I the mean, ending it, of season three is honestly, like, that is that is full, whole hog, a great ending. I looked at that like them saying, go on, go on Nickelodeon, I dare you to cancel us. Because by this point, because by this point in their run, Nickelodeon was already giving them the runaround with time slots and weird release windows. And you, you know that Nickelodeon, because like, and due to that, they were getting very poor ratings in season three. Uh, yeah. Uh, Nickelodeon fucked over Korra hard. They Nickelodeon really, did. really, really shit all over Korra. Like, as much as I have shit over Korra in this, uh, in this talk, talk cast, I mm -hmm. know that part of the problem was Nickelodeon treated this show like shit. And I am not going to let Nickelodeon off the hook for that. Nickelodeon... S Fucked this show over in a lot mm -hmm. of ways, and I think a lot of the problems that we saw wouldn't have, exi wouldn't have existed if they'd given them the time and the money to make the show that they wanted to make. And they fucked over season four even more, but season three was getting hit not only because of the negative reception of season two, but because like because of that reception, Nickelodeon was like, eh, I don't know, maybe we'll shift it here. We'll, we'll move it only to Nicktoons or something, and it just like they moved it to Nicktoons, then they moved it, it online only. Yeah, episode, season four, I think, like, the last few episodes were only online for a while until they aired it at some point. Uh, but, <clears throat> and, and that's a damn shame, because I think, like, while season four does not measure up to season one and, uh, one and three, I still think it is far above season two in quality. Oh, yeah, no, it's not even a, compa it's not even a comparison. By the way, uh, you know, I, I want to say this before I forget. There was something that I wanted to bring up it, from season two, but I, I didn't because we were moving, but I got to say this real quick. Mm -hmm. I really, 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 really would have loved Unalak if they had done what they were kind of hinting at the very beginning. I actually would have loved if the series had been about like, no, you don't understand. The world's going to hell. Uh, we need to connect back to the spirits. We need to fix this stuff. You guys don't understand what happened with that hundred year war. We're in a bad place. And if we don't start reconnecting, the world's going to be in danger. 
What if they had played more? If if they had played more with that idea instead of him just being like, "No, I want all the power. Give me the darkness." Yeah, we're at the very fucking end. It's like, now I want to be the dark avatar and lead the world into darkness. No, can, oh, that that's dumb. That's like can you, worse like, than the Fire Lord in terms of like low bars of villainy. Ah, imagine if they didn't touch on Rava and Vatu and just like never brought them up. But he wanted her to open up the spirit portal so that he could like I I don't know find a way to uh, commune with that energy and almost learn like a form of the Avatar's spirit bending nature. Like if he if he started to be able to kind of like channel that power and still kind of fulfilling that anti-Avatar like niche, but doing it in a much more interesting, less direct way. Yeah. Where he just kind of starts to be able to, you know, commune with these spirits, use them to his advantage and Korra has to find a way to, you know, restore balance where he is tilting it in a completely, like, completely opposite direction. That would have been much more interesting. And she wouldn't have even had to have killed him at that point. Like, he could have, no. he, he could have either, like... She could have, she could have trapped him in the, like, mist of lost souls or something. Or or just, like, shown him that he was wrong and how to fix things. And, ah, uh, they desperately wanted the good versus evil battle. And also that stupid kaiju fight that we can all agree. I literally don't know anybody who likes that fucking kaiju fight. I've never met a single person who was like, Oh, that was such a cool fight at the end. If you're one of those it people, makes, I respect you. I really sense. do. But... The kaiju fight made very little sense other than being kind of a, a, a visual spectacle. Like, it, 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 like you know, for those that like kaiju, having two giant things fighting in front of a city, yeah, kind of cool, whatever. I do not despouse anybody that does like that. Yeah, I just have not met anybody, which, you know, that's basically me just, you know, saying, oh, well, since nobody likes it, I'm obviously right. I'm sorry. That's not right. That That is a fucking, um, what do you call it? You're too uh, apologetic. Hold on to your opinions. Hey, I, 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 okay. I think that fight was dumb and you're dumb for liking it. That's, that's what you it, wanted, right? That went too far. <laughs> <laughs> Damn but, it. I'm out of balance. I'm a Korra <laughs> villain. Oh no. By the so, way, the out of balance so, stuff was so stupid. Yeah, and, and that played, like, season four, luckily, kind of, like, does away with a lot of these, like, it still touches on the spirit world stuff and, like, the spirit shit that's happening, but it focuses more on the world politics in a in a more interesting way. Like, in an actual sort of, like, <laughs> world-conquering, like, th these people are, like, pseudo-Nazi kind of way. Because uh, we end season three with Korra literally just being anemic in a wheelchair, unable to do anything. Yep. And there's a time skip where we kind of brush past all that recovery bullshit. Well, she, well we do initially, but... Kind of. Like, she's still feeling it. Like, she's still... Uh, like, she's still not at 100% her A-game. We, we find Korra, and she's literally in these uh, Earth Kingdom pit fights just trying to get back into the swing of things and she's getting the shit kicked out of her by these like you know basic bitch earthbenders and uh like you know she she's haunted by all of her past trauma which i think is the most interesting part of season four season four it, it, season four might have just been like book four ptsd yeah it's it's literally cora dealing with ptsd and, and we get some fun development from that. Uh, Mako finally relegated to a situation that best suits him, a B character in a comedy plot line. Oh. <laughs> it's the oh. best Mako gets, everybody. It's the best Mako gets as the, as the foil to a goofy heir to an Earth throne. Oh. Who that gets way more development than Mako ever does. That poor son of a bitch. I, I know I, 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 know he's, I, know, I know he's saddled with Mako. <laughs> oh man i don't i feel so bad because again mako could have been a character if he had a character oh but Prince yeah Wu, on, on, honestly like he starts off and he's meant to start am... off as just being the absolute fucking worst he is the john ralphio of cora i was literally going to say i was so surprised he wasn't played by ben schwartz I think it was a little bit before that time. Yeah. But yeah, it's but, it, it's really too bad. 
Like, he's, he's, like, up his own ass with his own importance. He's, like, way too out there. Way, way, way too goofy and stupid. Uh, but as the season goes on, I'm, I'm just going to start with Prince Wu so we don't have to talk about him anymore. Uh, yeah. He does, like, his, his idiocy does get a little bit more charming and endearing as time goes on. And as he starts to realize, okay, you know what, may maybe... Maybe this is more important than that. Maybe I should focus on this. And he, like, he actually develops into a semi-decent diplomat. Yeah. Ultimately abolishing, like, the monarchy. Saying, like, no, we're, we're just going to have elected officials. Kind of like what you guys have here. This seems to work. Cool. And I'm rich anyway. So maybe I'll do something. Maybe I won't. You know, but uh, Prince it's, Wu... It's a, it's a very... Uh, it's a very interesting political message that they're playing with him because he's literally uh, he's literally an appointed king. Everybody, like, when we hear the council talk, it's like, look, like, he's not going to be doing anything. He's just going to be ineffective. Like, he's just going to be kind of ineffective as, a, uh, as somebody in governance. We're just going to surround him by the real decision makers, which is some real world holy shit kind of messaging that you're throwing out there. Yeah. <laughs> From the good guys, by the way. Yeah. I would also like, like I, I to thought, point out... I thought that was really interesting. I want to... I, wanna... I love Avatar The Last Airbender, but it is very obvious that uh, Bryk, uh, DMR, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they don't understand how political systems work, or if they do, they had no... They, they did not know how to write them into the story. He has a George Lucas understanding of them. Yeah, and there's a lot of things that are said in these four seasons about their understanding of the polit of, of political systems and economies, etc. Um, that uh, and and they're they're not great. They're not, they're the things that they have to say aren't great um, because. Uh, sorry, I don't want to get too far into that, but I really don't like the fact that they're all, oh, hey, so by the way, we had him on, but don't worry, everything's equal now that we elected a non-bender as president, right? Because, you know, once you uh, once you elect somebody from a uh, minority, then that means that all the bigotry against them is no longer a problem in the system, see, correct? See, I think, I think that's ultimately the problem with the fact that this show is... I mean, it has to simplify politics. Yeah. It has to. But that's that's why I'm like, don't. Don't. Like, I really, really wish that shows would stop getting involved in politics if they can't send a good message. Because if the message they're ultimately going to send is bullshit, um, maybe just avoid it. Maybe you play, like, that's one of the reasons that Avatar was able to get away with the things that it did. Is like, no, this guy is a monster and, and a terrible, like, a terrible dictator, and we have to take him down. Yeah, that that's, like, a simple story. Story as old as time. Any JRPG can tell that story. If the story can be told in a NES game, that is what you can do in a, uh, a children's cartoon. Yeah, and that's why it's like, hey, let's avoid getting too involved in... And all of this, like, really heavy, really complicated stuff, unless we can tell, send a good message at the end of it. But it, they failed to do that in every single season, it felt like. Because they, because all they could, all the, the only message they could possibly send that was positive was, democracy is good, though. And it's like, cool. Thank you. That's great. It's, like I said, it's, it's the same kind of shit that, like, George Lucas did with the prequels. But, like, it's ultimately not the point is is kind of what i'm getting at it is <sighs> i i agree with you that if you're going to put any sort of spotlight on it sure may, maybe focus a little bit more on the nuance i would argue that they kind of like wh what i was saying when they were talking about appointing the earth king as like you know we need this guy here because he's literally a puppet yeah that that is a level of nuance that i don't expect in a children's show but you are right that the resolution of all of this is always very plain and simple and black and white, but that's unfortunately the nature of the beast that we're working with here in a children's cartoon. Yeah. And and it doesn't help. So Kuvira um, is, is fucking Hitler. She's... Who, by the way, uh, do you know who plays her? Oh, yeah. Zelda Williams, daughter yep, Robin of Robin Williams, Williams. Yeah. Robin Williams' daughter. Which uh, I did not know when I was looking up trivia. Like, I, I look up trivia before we do this stuff. Uh, 
I, that one kind of like caught me off guard. I'm like, oh shit, really? That's cool. Yeah, no, that was that like that was really fascinating, and that was something uh, I, I ended up hearing about when she hit the when, like. It's like, huh? Who is this? Like the moment she uh, premiered, I was like. Uh, da, ba, 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 Zelda Williams. Zelda. Oh, that's a. I didn't know that was a name that women actually had. Uh, ba, ba. What? What? Yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, yeah, she. She's a somewhat compelling villain in terms of the fact that what she wants to do ultimately is like you know unite the Earth Kingdom, get it all back in one place, b build an empire out of it. You know, quote unquote, for the good of the people. Uh, but they don't give her enough development to make her motivations make sense. Yeah. Because she, she, she just, she, she ultimately wants power. That's what she wants. She wants control, power. She wants the Earth Kingdom under one mantle, and she wants that mantle in her hands. Yeah. And for anybody who descends against her um, or is not part of the Earth Nation, she either... Uh, exports them or, or, you know, kicks them out of the country or puts them in literal camps. If if you or, were like or, or or six a Gundam on them, <laughs> or six a fucking the world's ugliest Gundam. Oh, the Zaku. Oh my God! What an ugly fucking oh God! Like by the way, technology made a huge jump this season. <laughs> yeah. Um. Like I. Uh, by the way, there's there's one part of season four that I want to talk about a little bit that was actually really super fascinating when it was happening. I I think it was. One of the things, one of the, one of the more interesting parallels that they made, um, so you know, I've already said that Kuvira is Hitler. The spirit vines are the atomic bomb, and yes, I thought that yeah, was no, yeah, that, that's very they're they're very blatant on that when I've, uh, I've, I've, when I've met some people that Go ahead. disagree that that was obvious. I've met people who really? vehemently believe that no, that's not supposed to be the atomic bomb. Hell, gone. Gon argued with me. It's like that's not what that is. And I'm like, are you kidding me? It's obviously supposed. I don't supposed know why. I don't know why I didn't invite Gon, like, to talk to Gon to ask if he wanted to be a part of this. He loves Avatar. I know. I right, would love yeah. to. He I would love to hear his take on this because he's busy making Varric, games. Varric has his "I am become death destroyer of worlds" moment when the cannon fires off from the first time. Like when he weaponizes, like when he accidentally weaponizes the spirit vines, he's like, "That's that's not what these were supposed to be meant for. These were supposed to be a source of energy for like the people, but get put in the hands of a powerful military. It's like, no, these are an amazing force of destructive power. I and fucking then you love have that. The, yeah, and and you have the mayor, president of Republic City, who's like, okay, we need some of that spirit vine technology here as well. We we need to fight fire with fire. And Varys like, no, I'm not doing that shit again. I thought it was a bad idea to begin with. I'm not giving two people that ability. Yeah, which yeah, yeah Varric has that moment where even the story realizes they rushed his development. For some reason, lately, I've just been having these thoughts about what's right and what's wrong and wanting to do the right thing, Julie. Yeah, he, that's your confidence, he, sir. Yeah, or, yeah or, that's or your conscience, conscience. Conscience, sir. And, yeah. he, he, even in the beginning of the season, he's still kind of a jackass jerk off to Julie. But by the end, uh, like, I, I don't, I, okay, I, I guess I understand the attraction. But I don't understand why she would instantly forgive him for literally all the immense amounts of bullshit that he puts her through and just be like, yeah, no, we'll, we'll get married. Oh, yeah. No, that's that's dumb and stupid. That, that but... never made sense to me at all. Like, yeah. you know, what? different strokes for different folks. If it works for them, it works for them. If you have a relationship like that and it's perfectly lovely and healthy, congratulations. I don't understand. Yeah, at least at the very least, she says, no, we're partners now. But it's like, mm -hmm. okay, but girl, you've been spending all this time literally being his, like, fucking just trash to him. She's, she's treated you like shit. How are you just going to put up with this? And I guess it's just, nope, that's their weird, quirky relationship. And at the very end, it, she it's... fucking, she says, hey, fucking treat me like equals. And then he does. And then they get married. She, okay. She's she's a rushed, like, weaker, quieter version of Pepper Pots. Yeah. Although apparently... Like she, she... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I'm I... really sad that she never fought anybody. Because it is implied that she is a fucking, like, beast. And like I would that, that she that she's like mercy for Lex Luthor. Yeah, I would have loved to have watched her actually lay out some dudes. Like that would have been that would have really kind of. Uh, they keep he kept implying it, but we never see it happen, and that made me sad. 
that that would have been cool. I agree. Maybe the Korra comics did something. I don't know. I'm never gonna. Wa- I'm never gonna read them. No, much uh, like much like the Avatar comics, the Korra comics only make things worse. Unfortunate. Yeah, because because uh, guess what? Guess what the Korra comics do? By the way. Oh God, what? It forgives Kuvira. Like the show already. Go, go, like, the show already is like, oh, hey, you know this woman who's literally been killing people and putting them in camps? Yeah, by the way, we're gonna just, like, she's not gonna serve any time in prison. She's gonna serve uh, uh, house arrest at Su Yin's place. So basically she gets off fucking scot-free. Probably she, one of the, like, she, she's probably one of the top three strongest earth, well, actually, she's probably the second strongest earthbender in the world. Yeah. Because she she fights Su Yin and Lin to a standstill on her own. She beats the Avatar in one-on-one combat. Uh, the only one that's probably stronger is Toph, who is easily the standout of season four to me. Like, I don't know about you. Toph? Toph, yeah. <sighs> See, Toph, Toph was this close to being like interesting and good, but then she has one of the dumbest scenes in all of Korra. Which one? The one where she talks about uh, the villains. Because I get what they were doing. Like, oh, hey, yeah. so like one of the overarching themes of Korra is when you're out of balance, you do the wrong thing. If you're too much like with, like, she says, Amon wanted equality. Unalog wanted to bring back the spirits. Uh, Zaheer, Zaheer wanted was... freedom, and yeah. and w- what does Kuvira want? Strength for her nation. But the problem is that that's all bullshit. All of I it's mean, bullshit. It... Unalak didn't want to bring back the spirits. Unalak wanted to rule the world as the Dark Avatar. Amon maybe wanted equality, but at the same time, it's it's so up in the air. And the story did such a bad idea of like presenting whether or not he was actually believed in what he said that at the very end like we had to have top explain it um and zahir was a fucking moron he wasn't he didn't go too extreme he just didn't know what he was doing he, yeah he he was a zealot i i i know what they were trying to do there and they I, I think they succeeded in what they were trying to do at least for me uh while yes there there is more to what she was saying for those villains uh ultimately she she was kind of like correct in pointing out that these guys like these were all kind of reflections in desires that Korra had as well. Everything that like she did was also kind of like slightly in service of what the bad guys were doing. She was just not going as hard. She needed to find like she needed to be the counterbalance to their like radical uh, their their radicalized ideals yeah well the idea that uh, the avatar brings balance which by the way uh is something that self-appointed by the avatar after the avatar fucked shit up like this whole like the avatar is supposed to bring bring balance thing kind of comes off as insincere or at least sort of flawed when it was a human being that caused the problem in the first place god damn it very much so and and that's something that toff points out like, Which but, she's like, uh, one of my favorite things that she actually says is like, uh, like when Cora's like, the world needs me, and Toph's like, no, it doesn't. The world right. will get on just fine without you. It'll, 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 like the sun will rise, it'll set. The world doesn't give a shit that you're here. Every like, you know, sure, you might do some good here and there, but the world keeps spinning no matter what. If you die, like, because think about it, the Avatar dies, and for at least like, you know, 13 or so years, at least, you don't have an a- active avatar. Nope. You have one that is learning, Co- like, and, and is like just a baby avatar that can't do shit to help the world, really. So in those 13 years, nothing's ever been that cataclysmic. The worst that's ever happened is Aang getting frozen in ice and the Fire Nation just wiping out a bunch of shit, but still life went on. Yep. The Avatar, what Toph said is true. The Avatar isn't necessary. The av- and, and it's something that the show actually kind of points out super hard in season two. The Avatar is literally a freak of nature. Yep. 
It's it's and, 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 and while for a lot of people that breaks the mysticism, that breaks the ideals, I I can look at it with like kind of a cynical eye because because you can because you can read it just for what Toph says. It's like, oh, come on, it's it's fine. The world the world will get along without you. It's gotten out along. It's got along without you before. It'll get along without you afterwards. What you like, you can still make a difference, but you know what difference you make is up to you. Or you can look at it through kind of the cynical eye that I look at it with is like, yeah, no, doesn't really matter. Like the, the uh, like sun will rise, sun will set. The world will move on with or without the avatar. It'll deal with cataclysms. That's what humanity does. It deals with tragedy and moves past it. Yeah. And I, I thought that was kind of interesting. And it, it also, you know, led into Toph's past where it's like, uh, yeah, she's a shitty mom, but she also still cares about her family. The reason she went to that swamp was to stay connected to the world and just keep tabs on everything that was going on. But essentially, she became Yoda. Yeah. Grumpy Yoda. Grumpy Yoda. And she's a highlight of this season because it starts off with a big time skip and a bunch of the people are working for the Nazis. Like, Bo Lin is working for the Nazis. Yeah. Uh, Varric working for the Nazis. Uh, I'm sorry, Kuvira's TM, Nazis. Uh, <laughs> uh, you have, like, the Earth, like, you have the Earth King, or the Earth Kingdom, which is ready for its next coronation after everybody, you know, everything got back to normal. Kuvira literally swept across the lands with an iron fist, uniting the land against the barbarians that were taking over after Zaheer, I guess, made anarchy and nobody else wanted to establish order. And uh, the, the big conflict there was that it wasn't supposed to be Kuvira that was doing it. It was supposed to be Su Yin for some reason. Uh, I guess because she was like the biggest of the noble families in the Earth Kingdom that well, yeah, had a Ku Kuvira, functioning stronghold. Yeah, Kuvira was like, yo, you need to step up. And fucking Suyin's like, no, that, that's not our purpose. That's not what we should do. And yeah, she, she, she wanted to hide away in her little metal shells. And Kuvira's like, man, fuck that. I'm, I'm going to do this myself. And I guess in the process of doing that, she... Uh, decided, you know what? I'm good at this. I like this. Everything seems peaceful after I leave. You know, you gotta be a little tough with them, but I think I'm good for this place, and I deserve to keep it. So I, I think that's the mentality that happened, but they never go into it. Well, and yeah, they never spend any time actually developing Kuvira until the very fucking end, where we're supposed to have this heart-to-heart -heart moment where Korra's like, I understand. We're not so different, you and I. And it's like, Cora, no. Cora, no. D don't. <sighs> like, look, I understand that you're really hot headed and that you've made a lot of mistakes in the past thinking, oh, I need to do this, and then rushing in and then making mistakes. This woman was putting people in camps. You don't get to go, oh, you just wanted what was best for your people because your mommy and daddy left you alone. Shut the fuck up, show. That's stupid. At the same time, I'm going to play devil's advocate again here with you. Kid show, I what, know, but... Uh. No, no, I'm not, I'm not even saying kid show. I'm saying that that, like, dark reflection of Korra, which is played out again and again and was pointed out very specifically by Toph, is yeah. something that Korra recognizes. Because one thing that Korra uh, had a lack of ever since her first encounter with Amon, when he, like, literally had her at his mercy, like, she's been dealing with this PTSD, she has lacked control. And that is something that Kuvira covets. So she sees Kuvira as this like reflection of like, look, like I don't want to feel powerless in this world. I am tired of being taken advantage of by these people that reign over me. And Korra, after like you know Toph's words of like you know all all these people like you know you're you're seeking kind of the same thing just in a different way, realizes. And gives Kuvira the we're not so different you and I speech that pretty much every other villain gave her. Which I think is, it's, it's kind of neat, uh, but ultimately, uh, it, like, just doesn't fire off the way it should. Yeah, and, and part again, part of that is just the show wants to make this message. It wants to say these things, and it just doesn't set any of them up well. 
Like, I understand what the messages of this show are. I get them. They, they're kind of laid out. They're sort of said blatantly. They just don't... And again, I gotta say this. This is my opinion, my perspective. When I say they don't work, obviously, I mean from my opinion. Yeah. But they don't it's... work for me. They all just come off as ham-handed and not earned or set up very well. Because again, this moment where Korra is trying to identify with Kuvira, like... Korra spent the first two seasons being a total ass brat. And it wasn't until season three and four that she is brutally... She's brutalized, by the way. I, I don't think we touched upon in the show. This show really hurts her in horrible ways. Uh, just yes. to knock her down a peg. And it's, and, and it's hard to watch. And sometimes it feels unnecessary to go through this sort of amount of pain and, and, and anguish just to teach her this lesson. I don't know. There's, there's a lot it, going on they, there. They, de they definitely go over the top in a lot of ways. At, at some points in each of the seasons, she always hits a new low. In each of the seasons, sometimes yeah. it's near the beginning. Some like in season three, it's at the very end. In season two, it's kind of in the middle. And in season one, it's after her moments when like it, it all starts. Every single piece of this humbling starts when she is literally at Amon's mercy, and he's like, "I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do this to you now. I'm gonna let this simmer because when I do this, the I want to do it publicly." See. And the like, it's like it's going to be something that shakes the whole world. And there's, the, I think it's very important in that moment that Cora is actually a woman, like a, a girl. I mean, yeah, it the the, the it, imagery that's, that's and the visuals level, are yeah the the yeah it's it's very implicative of some very horrific things that can scar people for a very long time, uh, and you might never get past that sort of feeling of helplessness and powerlessness, even though you are, even if you are the most powerful person in the world. Yeah, they, 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 it felt very intentional that that was the sort of visual and implication that was going on there, mm -hmm. um, which is, um, I think maybe a little out of depth for this show, if I'm going to be completely honest with you. I, I think it was veiled enough that the younger audience can say, that's a spooky moment, but the older audience, like you or I, could look at it and say, holy shit. Yeah. Um, so it, I think it's very effective because of that. Yeah. But again, ultimately, at the end of at, at the end of the day for me, there were all these wonderful, like, uh, there were all these messages, all these ideas, uh expressed visually expressed through the, through the dialogue but because the story was so poorly told never worked because they couldn't make this overarching narrative and the time that they had to make these condensed uh you know personalized uh what do you call it this segregated narratives they just they couldn't do it they couldn't tell these whole stories in these 13 episodes each with as many characters as they had with as many turning cogs as they had with it just it no story in all of Korra resonates the way i feel like they want it to and that's why that's by the end of it all i could look at it at Korra was a beautifully animated passionate mess of a show and that's the, the you hit it on you hit the nail on the head there. That's the biggest like that's the biggest division between Korra and Ava, like the last airbender uh, is the fact that each of the seasons needed to end somewhere where the show could just end. And that hurt it in such a way that you can't tell this overarching story, this overarching grand adventure where you can expand on themes as you go. Because you never know when your last season was going to be because Nickelodeon was being a really shitty company about all this. Yeah. Also, the serialized nature of the stories that they were trying to tell, that is a, that is a huge difference between uh, Avatar and Korra. Avatar mm -hmm. was episodic, but with a serialized underpinning. Like, there was an overarching story that led them throughout these more singular stories. Grandiose adventures. Yeah. yeah. Like... Whereas it, it, it could be more monster of the week while just kind of giving you like little uh, like little movements towards the end goal. 
And Korra, meanwhile, had to have like plot beat, plot beat, plot beat, plot beat, because it needed to fit all of this into 13 episodes every season. Yeah, it was one of the only reasons, uh, one of the only ways that we're going to be able to tell all of these stories. And I actually think that sort of worked against it. I think it was kind of difficult to get a real, like to really develop the characters when everything needed to be in service of the overall plot, like everything. So you didn't get a lot of these little moments with characters to develop them or the uh, or, or, or the concepts, like the overall message of the show. And that's why by the end of it, I don't know, it's, it's tough. It's tough because I remember when I was watching Korra, I was so excited for the show and I was, it, hell, all the way to the end, I still really enjoyed it through my first watch. But every, mm-hmm. but unlike with Avatar, I've watched all of Avatar The Last Airbender, which is a lot of episodes. I've watched all of it three times. I have watched Korra three times. Avatar only got better for me as I rewatched it. Korra only got worse. And that's frustrating. Like, because I thought if I rewatched Korra, I'd be able to see it as this cohesive thing. I could really start to connect the, the stuff that maybe I missed that first time. But no. No, I, in fact, I I actively started to notice things that bothered me more. And that's frustrating. <laughs> My opinion is similar. Uh, obviously, Avatar The Last Airbender is a far, far superior show on the whole. Like, it is just great. I, I can... I will probably watch that series through at least another three times in my lifetime if I'm given the chance. Korra, on the other hand, like, it, it is inferior in a lot of ways. Like I said, it, it's it's a series of peaks and valleys where the peaks can get pretty damn high. Like, there are some awesome moments that I love in Korra, but the valleys can get so, so low. Yeah, like the great the great divide is nothing on the valley that this this show can have. Oh God, great the fucking season two is a season long great divide. Pun, yeah, pun superintended, BT Dubs. Uh, but what surprised me, and going into it, I did not expect this. I actually enjoyed Korra more the second time I watched it. Okay. And this is the second time that I've been through it because I was able to notice a lot of these other themes that I hadn't picked up on before. Uh, and, you know, kind of like put two and two together. And while overarching, like as an overarching full cohesive unit, it will never, ever compare to The Last Airbender, unfortunately. I still think it has a lot of a lot to its merit. And I think it is very, I think it stands alone pretty damn well. Uh, as maybe not something that's in that super S tier that Avatar's in, but I might throw it somewhere in the A or B tier still in terms of like children's cartoons that I've enjoyed. And the, yes, uh, I, by the way, thank you all uh, for sitting here for two hours while a couple of white yeah, guys no, we, in their 30s talk about children's cartoons. You're the yeah, real we, MVPs. We've gotten, we've, got, we've gotten super over on this one, and but I feel like we had a lot to talk about. I here. was not going to, I was not going to settle for any less if I'm going to be real honest. If, if you, I if, wasn't if either. I, 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 hey, I felt it, so I, I kept it going. And you know what? Bless the lot of you for sticking with us. Uh, I, I guess the next time we'll be talking about Avatar will probably be when we get more information on the live action show, if that's still happening, which I suppose it is. Possibly, but yeah. can't finish this without talking about the ending, which when I first saw oh it, boy. super fucking out of nowhere to me, the whole Korasami thing. I also, for some reason... When I first saw it on television, I distinctly remember them leaning in for a kiss. But when I saw it on Netflix, no, they just kind of stand there looking at each other and they fade out. Like, okay, th- like th- the- that is that is how it happened in the original. I assure you. Okay, I I, I believe that, but I guess that's just my uh, Mandela effect going off. I was like, I could have sworn they leaned in. Like they didn't show the kiss. I remember, like I definitely remember they didn't show the kiss. But I yeah. I could have sworn they leaned in or got closer together. There is a there's actually a version online where they somebody made an edit, like that. I I, I recall that. Yeah. So okay. From my perspective. What's, uh, yeah. What's what's your opinion on Korasami? Because like I said, I, I watched through this. I watched through Korra this time through the lens of, okay, I want to see their relationship develop. 
And I, I noticed little things here and there, like the fact that they talked about the fact that they communicated while she was in exile and uh, a couple of blushing glances here I and like there. I like her hair. Yeah. Yeah. Like little, little, little gal, like little like moments that actually plays off as legitimate bonding, but nothing that played out quite this, like it, it never gave to me many romantic implications. There was definitely like subtext but it's still, after rewatching it, even through that lens, I'm like, yeah, you know what? That ending still kind of feels out of nowhere. Hey, no, that... your, your, your dad just died? Want to wanna go on a fuck party with me to the spirit world? Is not okay. what I expect. Let me, let, me, let me say this outright. That ending sucks. It, yeah. it sucks. Um, mostly because it, it is just, it is a, the entire thing, like the entire thing is a raison d'etre. Oh wait, no, not raison d'etre. Uh, what is the shoot? What is the uh, coming down? Um, I I I I'm always mix it up with raison d'etre, even though raison d'etre is a completely different phrase. Um, falling it's, action. The falling action. It, it all that second part is like that whole dénouement, dénouement. It's okay. n nothing but dénouement, and there's n at the very end of it. Nothing interesting happens. Nothing grandiose is said. No, like Varric's wedding is the is the framing device for the ending, and it's like, oh, I guess it's we, over. Like, or yeah, we do, we don't get to say goodbye to half the characters. I mean, we we it, do. It's it's so fucking rushed. We we get to say we get to say goodbye to the main characters. We get to say goodbye to Bolin and Mako, um, and and Tenzin, but kind of. No, no, we get a moment with Tenzin. We do. Like, we get a moment with all of them. It, they're just lame moments. Like, yeah. they, they, there was they're no... They're underwhelming. Uh, everything about the ending is underwhelming. Yeah, it's underwhelming. There's nothing, like... So, by the end of it, she sits down with Asami, and let me say this. So, this was revolutionary at the time. Yeah, it, it was. it was a big deal. Yeah, because like it's, a lot of a lot of a lot of Avatar fans, as they were watching through, started to say, "Fuck it, just have Korra and Asami get together." They both share the fact that Mako was a just, well, Mako, and they broke up with them, and they've bonded so much. Why don't they just become a couple? And it seemed like Bright picked up on that somewhere at the beginning, either the beginning of season three or ending of season two, because it starts to kind of lean that way as season three and four progress. So by the end of it, the idea of them getting together was already on the minds of a lot of people in the fandom. But it was also one of these things where it's like, yeah, we'd love to see them get, you know, become closer and become a couple. So the ending is, oh yeah, by the way, the big reveal of the ending is that they're now a couple. And yeah, they, like, they had like a, they had like a, a background, I mean, may, maybe they hadn't even like, you know, really discussed the fact that they were thinking about being in a relationship together, because, like, it's implied that there's obviously an attraction there. Yeah. That they, that they have a very close-knit bond, but all of that was in the background. Like, all the information is very, like, subtext. Yep. And when I was watching it, though, let me tell you, when I was watching it, as a person who grew up without a single gay character in his kids' shows, without even the, with only the inclination, literally either being characters who are a joke or villains... Um, and finally, for for the first moment in his entire life, seeing the implication that these characters of the same sex might end up together? No, you better bet that when it happened, I made a noise that made Christopher check on me. I was psyched. I was so happy. I was, I couldn't believe it. Like, Kor and Asami got together. Holy shit, that's what we all wanted. That's that's what like that's what all the people who who wanted first of all some representation wanted and also people who kind of thought yeah no no they're just a good they they match they would work well together they're opposites attract and they've already shown that they can be friends why don't why not make them a couple yeah no they make sense as a couple so when they did it even though there wasn't enough build up even though they didn't develop it even though it was so subtle and 
arguable. So arguable that the creators had to come out afterwards and say, no, they gay. The fact that it happened, it meant the world to, to me and other fans. And do you uh, think it do you, do you think it opened the door for things like Steven Universe oh, to have like wholeheartedly. The, the... I I 100% believe that Cora walked so other shows could run. I think the fact that they they made it happen um helped other shows. And and some people and look, I'm not I already said the ending sucks. Okay, the ending does suck. It is underwhelming and the whole romance angle is rushed. I'm not going to argue that point with you, okay? But it was important for us. It was important and interesting and in a show that was already heavily flawed. You know what? I'm just going to take this as a fucking win. I'm sorry I am. Hey, so, no, abso absolutely. I I think it was for media. I think that moment was very important. Like, they, they were able to do it in a way that they were able to, you know, get it past anybody that might say, Oh, no, two lady kiss bad. In a, in a way that, like, you can still say, yeah, no, they're gay or bi or whatever. It doesn't matter. It's two women in a relationship together. That's the point. Yeah. They are together. And that is what matters. So now you can have more shows that are open about that because people are like, yay, go inclusivity. All for that. Uh, so now you can have shows like uh, Owl House that do it more openly in like a, a children's television setting. Uh, She-Ra, Steven Universe. Keep there are probably like a, a, yeah, a billion different shows out there now that are uh, really play like really playing for that you know it's really funny the one romance that they barely develop at all was still healthier and less annoying than the ones they did yes <laughs> yes oh uh, very very much so uh but yeah. so yeah in that regard while it's still very much out of nowhere uh like if you don't read into the subtext even if you do read into the subtext it's still kind of like a okay that I didn't see that coming necessarily, uh, but I can't blame Cora. Girls got girls got good taste. Asami definitely top tier. Oh yeah, uh, and so. and and I should note that them getting together at the very end like that isn't even necessarily bad. It was really just the fact that that's no. kind of all that ending was. That that was yeah, that, just, that's, that's the that's, real that's, big that's, problem. That's all you get. Like the the big thing is uh, like the reason she decides to go is like I mean first it's Cora and uh, they've obviously developed a bond obviously enough to be considered romantic together, uh, but she she literally went through like the biggest arc that she goes through in the entire show which is the forgiveness uh, arc with her father, uh, who I mean is basically just Hayao Miyazaki I guess. Uh, oh yeah right that that was very that's, intentional. That's just, that's just what he look that's just what he looks like. <laughs> Uh, she finally gets like a forgiveness arc with him because one thing we didn't touch on in season one, uh, Asami's dad was working with the Mon because he doesn't like Benders. Yep. And so uh, Asami finally, you know, meets up with him. It's like, okay, w w like, you know, Kuvira's attacking with her Jaeger and we need as many geniuses as we can to try to deal with that. And he sacrifices himself to make sure that everybody else can take this thing down. Which, I, I cannot overstate how stupid the fucking Jaeger is. I mean, it's an interesting set piece, but where the fuck did it come from? Yeah, no, that fucking, that giant robot sucks. They should never have introduced the robots in that show. God, ah. Kuvira was so much more interesting when she was just a badass metal better. Yeah, better. she didn't. But then, she... yeah, this, it has lots of problems. Like, yeah. The, I... the show has, the show has a climax issue. Yeah. Um, so, like... She just went through that arc, and at the wedding, you know, she's still real sad. Her dad's fucking dead. Just, died, like, not even 48 hours ago or something. And yep. Cora's like, hey, you want to get out of here? Just go with me on a vacation to the spirit world? It's like, you know what? Yes. And that's just how it ends. Like, they go out, they wander off together into the spirit sunset, and, you know, just have, have a gay old time. Yeah. And that's that's kind of what you end up with. And you know what? You know, a an underwhelming ending uh, doesn't always have to be like. Honestly, if the journey really is it, that good, and the ending just kind of fizzles out, that's not so bad. I think one of the bigger issues is, you know, that uh, that journey though. Hmm. Peaks and valleys. Yeah, peaks, peaks and valleys. Peaks and by and the end, you're uh, by, by the end, you're kind of exhausted. Yeah. 
And as I said, them going off to the fucking spirit world to have a fucking uh, a, a vacation wasn't the bad part of it. It was just the underwhel- another underwhelming part of all the other stuff that was underwhelming. Yeah. So, so that's that's Korra in a nutshell in our longest episode since I think our Star Wars review, which I think was like an hour and a half or something. Yeah. Wow. Uh, so we're. We had a lot to say about the sequel series to Avatar. But what do you think? Let us know if you're watching in the YouTube archives. Uh, what what are your thoughts on Korra? Everybody in chat, we've been seeing you as you've been going for those that tune in on Stream 4 Star every Wednesday. And, of course, for those of you listening at home, we greatly appreciate you uh, letting us into your ear holes. And we'll see all of you next time on the TalkCast Pod Show. Later, everybody. Flemio, hot man.